everyone. So uh, this is our second day of this meeting. We thank everyone who's up and around uh, this morning. I, uh, I would make the following announcements. The first day was considered, uh, from what I've heard and feedback, uh, a really great success and people I think enjoyed uh, the presentations. Um, there were actually more than 900 people attending uh, in person and virtually, which is pretty large meeting for us. So we're very pleased that we're getting back on track. Um, the, yeah, so we, okay, let's, let's thank ourselves for thank ourselves for attending. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate, but um, <laughs> self congratulations for living. Um, so, so uh, the only um, issue yesterday, which is even visibly I'm seeing a change, is we really had some trouble with time management. We weren't particularly disciplined. Um, and I apologize for that. That's obviously not one of our strengths, but I guess to fix it, the, the um, lords of meetings have put a timer on here that wasn't there yesterday. And somebody put the timer on there and I'm looking at it and so it's very intimidating, you know. And, and I've got to say that sometimes I've been in a meeting and I know the time is broken because I'll start, you know, like a, a 15 minute talk and it'll be at my, like just now, for example, it went to red you know, while, I, while I was speaking to you. So, so please, let's, 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 I've already exhausted, I've exhausted my welcome. So, so in, in summary, we're very glad we're all here the second day. We have a really exciting program this morning, um, as you'll see. And I think Melissa is the moderate. Oh, <laughs> The scary point. Thank you. Melissa, will, will, Melissa Turner, uh, who leads our community working activities, is going to be the moderator. So thank you, Melissa. So take over. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask our uh, panelists to come up to the uh, podium so we can all be in place and uh, facilitate our time and use our time wisely. And we tr did struggle with time yesterday, but we had very robust and meaningful conversations. So um, we want to continue that theme today. Thank you all for returning for the second day's full plenary session and welcome back. And uh, we had a wonderful reception last night. I thought that was great to see this network that works so hard together also play together and enjoy one another. Uh, some wonderful dancers in this audience as well. So uh, thank you all for making it back for this morning's plenary. And we have um, plans for another uh, meaningful uh, dialogue and discussion on the peaks and valleys of interventions. Uh, for this plenary, we thought we would discuss where we are as a network and in the broader public health field in terms of facilitating uptake of prevention interventions in HIV and MPOX. And just to have a dialogue as to where we are, what we've learned, um, what successes we've uh, experienced, what challenges we've experienced within our own uh, clinical trial portfolio, and also what's happening in the public health space nationally. And so we've assembled uh, panelists to engage in this dialogue today. And I have, in addition, to um, uh, the, the peaks and valleys of interventions, I've asked each panelist to also share, if they care to, any big, innovative, uh, visionary solutions that they see as helpful in facilitating the uptake and use of interventions. We have been uh, successful as a network in advancing uh, the prevention toolkit in a number of areas, in a number of ways. But the extent to which those uh, tools are actually utilized by the populations that can most benefit them has been challenging and, and difficult. And yet there have been some successes uh, to reference as well. And so that's been the charge to our panelists today to discuss from their unique uh, perspectives and from their work in the field uh, what they perceive as the successes and challenges in uh, linking these interventions with the people who most need them. And we've also asked them to think big, to think in a visionary way about what they would change and what they would put in place if they could, to have sort of a robust discussion about um, the next steps and what's on the cusp in the field. So let's get started um, with our first presenter on this topic of the peaks and valleys of interventions uptake. 
Uh, our first presenter is Dr. Patrick Sullivan. Um, Patrick is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Epidemiology at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health in Atlanta. He is an infectious disease epidemiologist with postdoctoral training and experience uh, with the CDC. His research focuses on health inequities in the HIV epidemic, interventions to improve the use of HIV prevention services, and data visualization to promote the use of public health data for prevention. So this is clearly within your purview. And so we welcome you to discuss access to testing and PrEP, challenges and opportunities in the United States. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, this is a face of someone who planned for a 10-minute talk and found out he has 12 minutes. Very, very excited. Um, these are my um, disclosures, which aren't related to the work that I'm talking about today. So uh, the question that I really wanted to address is, how are we doing with access to HIV testing and PrEP in the United States? Um, and I added overall and in terms of equity, and how can we do better? And sort of the punchline is going to be that um, testing and, and PrEP are widely available, but we're not always getting those services to the people who need them most. And I so appreciate that you opened the session by talking about getting things to the people who need them most, which is going to preview our focus on equity. So we have to aim towards equity, and we have to be specific about the barriers, which are transportation, stigma, cost, access, that are keeping people from getting services that would benefit them. And the good news is research has identified new avenues and tools, including some mHealth tools that lower the barriers to testing and PrEP. And now we have to think about how we build a public health capacity to scale them. And I'll address some of these issues. So I'll just start out with HIV testing. CDC recommends that all adults in the US be tested at least for HIV at least once in their lifetime. And you can see in the, the far right bar that we're hitting about 40% on that metric. Um, so there's still room for improvement. Uh, but the other thing about this graph, this uh, CDC uh, depiction of BRFSS data that's interesting is that there's a lot of heterogeneity among groups. And in fact, the highest group-specific lifetime testing prevalence is in black Americans. And I want to point this out um, because there's some resonance to the idea that black Americans are the group who are at highest risk um, for HIV infection and also have the highest prevalence of testing. So this will be one of the few examples in the talk where there's sort of a positive um, signal towards equity. The group with the greatest uh, risk is also the group that's uh, getting the most access. Um, just quickly, wh what else do we need to do um, for all adults testing once in a lifetime? This may be people who are uncomfortable raising the issue with providers, um, whose providers aren't raising the issue to them who have access issues or who don't perceive themselves to be at risk, and home testing uh, may be a good solution that addresses many of those issues. Moving to men who have sex with men, uh, for whom CDC recommends HIV uh, testing at least once per year for sexually active gay and bisexual men, um, the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance in 2021, which is in urban areas, um, uh, uh, documented that about three quarters of gay and bisexual men had tested for HIV in the, in the previous 12 months. Oh. Uh, okay, I see. There's a great big forward button and a little tiny back button. Uh, we look at HIV testing for MSM from NHBS. We see that there's about 80% testing and there's not a lot of difference among uh, the groups by race and ethnicity. These again are as a focus on urban uh, men. And so I'm going to supplement this with data from Travis Sanchez's American Men's Internet Survey, which enrolls substantial numbers of rural men as well. And we see about the same thing. The question here is that it's at least annually, and there may well be men who would benefit from even more frequent testing. And so I'll talk a bit about that. So in the space of testing, you know, what's working and not yet at scale? So I'll just give, these are um, from the CDC's Prevention Research Synthesis uh, Compendium. Uh, with the keywords of HIV testing and good or best evidence. So M-Cubed is a mobile app um, supported at, by CDC that um, the development and testing was supported by CDC that's associated with a doubling of HIV testing for MSM, not available after the trial because the scale of putting up a national app 
um, is not, turns out is not something that universities are well prepared to do and something that's challenging for the federal government. So this is going to be one of my opportunities. Trust is a brief peer-based behavioral intervention developed by, um, uh, 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 <laughs> Well, rough morning, um, is a peer-based behavioral intervention meets that best um, uh, criteria, uh, evidence criteria developed by Victoria, Sh uh, and I just had it, um, uh, but not yet uh, deployed. The one that is deployed is e-stamp. Um, so this was a CDC-supported study where we mailed out four HIV self-test kits to MSM every three months, uh, and it was associated with a tripling of the t HIV testing rate uh, in a year and no difference in linkage to care. Victoria Fry, thank you, old brain. This is what the scale up of eStamp looks like. Um, this is Together Take Me Home. It's a currently active uh, test kit distribution program. It's a partnership of CDC, Emory University, um, NASTAD, and Building Healthy Online Communities. Uh, people can go on, order test kits delivered free to their home and test themselves at home. Um, the goal was to distribute a million kits. Uh, we aim to distribute 200,000 kits in our first short program year, and uh, what I can say is that demand is significantly higher than um, we anticipated. So we're really excited for the enthusiasm for this program. Um, now let's talk about PrEP, because the situation is a little more complicated. And this is PrEP use among MSM um, with indications. And so as opposed to the, the HIV testing, where we saw relatively high levels of testing across race ethnicity, here we see that, the, that black, gay, and bisexual men have uh, the lowest prevalence of uptake of PrEP um, among the groups. And this difference is especially pronounced when you compare that to the, lifetime, the relative lifetime risk of HIV infection. So it's really important that when we talk about this that we not say that the black men are not taking advantage of services. I think instead what we need to say is that, that the health systems are not serving black gay men. These are, um, if, if you sort of look at these gaps between the blue and green bars as evidence of inequity, this gap is the result of structural racism and lack of access. Uh, and conversely, we should say that th this um, over relative overperformance by white MSM is a result of access and privilege. So we need to call these things what they are because the solutions follow from that. Uh, Aaron Siegler has quantified this idea of the gap between need and use as the PrEP to need ratio. This is just a number that expresses PrEP use um, with a denominator of uh, HIV infections. And what you can see is that starting in 2024, the equitable use of PrEP in white Americans has um, taken off like an airplane, and, um, and in, for black and Hispanic Americans, uh, there really hasn't been that same trajectory. And this leads us to a ninefold greater equitable use in white Americans and a fourfold greater use, I'm sorry, a sevenfold greater use of uh, PrEP in Hispanic and uh, white than Hispanic uh, Americans. So why does this happen? Um, I'm going to uh, just quickly uh, give you a little geography lesson of Atlanta um, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar. This is a map of the zip codes in Atlanta. Each shape is a zip code. The darker shades are where the risk of HIV diagnosis is higher. I, the blue line is I-20, which is our um, north, south, our east-west interstate. And the, and the circled area there is this area in South Atlanta where the greatest concentration of, of, count, of zip codes where you are at a high risk of acquiring HIV are. We would like to see the prevention services concentrated in that area of highest need. This map, next map is the same kind of area, the interstate for reference, and this same area, uh, if you can see the colors of these, is populated by blue dots, each of which is 500 black Atlantans. This is a very um, heavily black part of Atlanta. And on the right is the location of our prep providers. So this is an example of structural racism, where where these black Atlantans at very high risk of HIV infection are living, we have kind of a prep desert. Um, so what's working and not at scale? The M cubed app, um, the one that was associated with the double rate of testing was also associated with the double rate of prep starts, not available because of scaling issues. PrepMate developed by Al Liu and Jonathan Fuchs um, is actually in production. It's an SMS technology that's a lower technology bar. Uh, and so that is available. And Prepare um, to Start, developed by Phil Chan, um, is, uh, has materials but is not currently being used anywhere. 
So we have tools that are proven effective by CDC's criteria that we're not scaling yet. So we were asked to talk about peaks and valleys. I took this literally. Um, I think the peaks is we have great interventions. We have great medical care. We have significant and important investments in prevention. And we have an example now of going from a research project, actually it was from a research project to another research project to another research project to a national HIV kit distribution program that has significantly higher demand than we planned for. The valleys are that we have insufficient levels of uptake for these interventions. And critically, we're failing to achieve equity. And I just wanna, I hope we can come back to this point, but if we're not serving the people at greatest need with these interventions, then we're also not getting the biggest prevention bang for our buck. For a fixed investment, the best return is to get them to the people who are most likely to benefit from them. We have to address the underlying social and structural determinants of health, and we need to develop platforms for the distribution of technology interventions that are agnostic to who developed them, but that are part of our public health capacity. So we were asked to come up with big ideas. Here are my big ideas. We need to fully support the ongoing HIV test kit distribution program and maximize utilization of that. Um, this touches uh, people who have elevated risk. This touches adults who've not had that one HIV test in their life, and it's working. We need to set prep priorities and measure our success according to equity metrics. And if we do that, we're actually gonna increase the number of infections that we avert because we are getting prep to the people who need it most. Um, we need to develop a common shared public health platform to disseminate efficacious M health interventions. I think no university, no single health department um, is gonna be able to make this investment, but it can serve multiple interventions. We have to, we know that uh, having health coverage is associated with, uh, with better PrEP equity. States that have prep app programs or Medicaid expansion have higher levels of PrEP equity. So we need to continue to advocate for increasing health coverage by any and all means, and that means Medicaid expansion, PrEP dot programs, national PrEP program, um, we need access. And finally, we need to fully integrate and scale home-based options. We've talked about HIV testing. There's also STI testing, which I think we're gonna hear more about later this morning. Um, home-based prep and home-based viral load monitoring. I'd like to thank the many colleagues who contributed and shared slides for this, and I will turn things back to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, beautifully delivered and sus succinct talk on uh, health equity and how we can address uh, getting our resources to those who could benefit the most. We're going to move on to our next presenter, uh, who is Dr. Laron Nelson, on what are we learning from our HIV prevention trials network, uh, Vanguard Study 096. And uh, Dr. Nelson is the Independence Foundation Professor and Associate Dean of Global Affairs and Planetary Health at the Yale School of Nursing. He directs the Justice, Community, Capacity, and Equity Corps in the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at the Yale School of Public Health. And Dr. Nelson is also one of our HPTN scholars. Uh, he co-chairs uh, HPTN 096 and leads active HIV intervention implementation research in the United States, Canada, and Ghana. It's my understanding that uh, Dr. Nelson is in transit from a tra uh, uh, traveling from an international location that he's been good enough to uh, make himself available to be with us. And we appreciate you, uh, Dr. Nelson, for your adaptability and flexibility far beyond what I could produce uh, following international travel. So we appreciate you being here. I see your, uh, I see you visually, and I'm hoping that well, we can hear you as well. But welcome, and thank you for being here. Let's give Dr. Nelson a welcome for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. It's my pleasure to be here to talk to you a few uh, minutes this morning about the HPTN 096 study. I wish I could be there with you this morning in person, but I'm also grateful for my study co-chair, Bob Brimian, who's agreed to be on stage in case this something goes wrong with this presentation. So I'll talk about the peaks and valleys of implementation science and using lessons we learned from HPTN 096. So this presentation will highlight three things. Uh, 
The first issue I really want us to think about is that communities are not controlled settings and that unpredicted challenges can occur at multiple levels that could threaten this, the success of an implementation trial. In HPTN 096, we've taken an adaptive, maybe dynamic, bend, don't break approach in ways that we think will help us maintain relevance and viability amid sometimes turbulent conditions in the communities where we're working. And then in ways that this should advance the science is for us to know and have some information that multi-level integrated strategies uh, that are tested in implementation trials really have to recognize communities as assets and partners and be responsive to the realities of life experienced by organizations that serve these communities. Uh, HBTN 096 uh, test and multi-level status neutral integrated strategy to prevent HIV infections among black MSM, black men who have sex with men in the American South. The strategy combines social behavior interventions with structural interventions to facilitate the adoption of biomedical interventions. You see that in the center of that circle. Uh, to facilitate their adoption by healthcare facilities and also their use by black men who have sex with men. Uh, in this study, we prioritized partnering with Black-led organizations and organizations that serve Black gay men. And so in this, in this talk about peaks and valleys, I'll start different than where uh, Dr. Sullivan started. L let's start in the valley here. So first of all, racism then and now has systematically underdeveloped Black communities in the South. The years of underinvestment in Black communities has constrained the ability of black organizations to mount the type of response that they think is necessary to address the inequities that we see in the epidemic. These are some examples of how this has happened. There are limited funding opportunities for the type of work that they believe need to be done and how they think it should be done. It's more easy to find uh, opportunities that tell us how to do it, not opportunities that allow us to self-determine what needs to happen in our communities. Uh, in competing with larger, often predominantly white legacy institutions, the black organizations have not garnered equitable resources to do this work. There's been little prior investment of research capacity building in black communities. There are some notable exceptions, but in generally this is the case. Uh, there are some new organizations that have sprung up to really contribute to this cause, but Many of them are in startup mode and need more time to be more fully and firmly stabilized. So all of this has led to a bias in public perception that black organizations are not as good as the organizations that have more control of the resources, state, federal, whatever. But this has the effect of, uh, of uh, determining whether and how organizations can recruit staff, whether they can retain staff, whether staff end up in other parts of the uh, community in places that can pay more or have more of those resources in a particular competition or in general. So then what you have is a situation where staff can sometimes be forced to work in places where they ex experience stigma and discrimination. And sometimes these organizations are the same places where clients who need to access that place for prep or treatment also experience stigma and discrimination. Uh, in uh, HPTN 096, we did encounter some circumstances that we did not forecast. Some of them were boosts to the study and some of them were setbacks. So a, a boost, I would say, is we had a situation where local community input and advocacy, vigorous advocacy, led us to reshape the health equity component of the integrated strategy. Originally, it was a nationally managed, centralized model. And the community feedback really helped us understand that we needed to change it, which we did, to a model that was decentralized and had more local community control that improved the design. Uh, but we also had some setbacks. Uh, in one community, there was an organization that had financial crises that actually led to the takeover of two major HIV and STI service providers in this community. And while the, the agencies did not close down, in an effort to reduce operating costs, they did cut services. And those services were the ones that address 
some of the social determinants of health that Dr. Sullivan just talked to us about, uh, those were gone. <laughs> Uh, that's not about black MSM behavior. These are structural issues that have an impact on the ability to get access uh, to the services that they need and how they need them. We had a situation during the course of this study where two chief executives of black led organizations in two different communities died. Uh, this, this sudden loss of leadership is something that creates anxiety in the community about whether and how we can have a, a coordinated, cooperative response across the region. It also shows that social status does not insulate Black MSM from excess mortality. And then in our study, we did a cross-sectional assessment, uh, and we found that the HIV prevalence in that sample was extraordinarily high, uh, higher than we anticipated when we designed the study, and higher than what we had powered the study to detect the change in. So these factors, I guess you could say, can happen across any study, at any place, at any point in time, but they're all happening now, all at once, in a particular part of the country, and this is a crisis. This is the context in which we're trying to implement our integrated strategy. And so this crisis has implications. I'll talk about them briefly, but the first thing I'll say is that Black communities where we've worked are giving it their all. They are all in on HP 10096. Uh, and they're doing it in some ways at risk, uh, risk of their investment of time to participate in the study, sometimes the labor of staff who they allow to participate in the study with us, but also risk of intangible social and cultural resources, such as trust, which you just heard about, their reputation and credibility, allowing us to be present on their media and social platforms, them leveraging their connections and relationships to mobilize support for 096, offering us their local insights, which are often <laughs> very closely guarded. They're making that available to us readily and sometimes proactively, offering novel inventiveness and creativity for how we think about the interventions within the study, prioritizing 096 within their work activities, and then patience. <laughs> Uh, which they've offered to us. These are things that are hard to get and some studies never get them. Uh, so we benefited from that. The implications uh, for the study is that there is some financial loss and ex a loss of experience when agencies and individuals, uh, when there's a lot of shakeup in that regard. Uh, there can be timeline delays for implement implementation of key components of the study. One thing that has uh, had a serious implication for us is the inability to, to commit to them that this is a multi-year study. So uh, we've had questions about what are our next steps from our, com our conversations with those who support the study, those who fund it. Uh, and so, because we're uncertain <laughs> from year to year about what we're doing, the community is also uncertain about what their partnership with us actually means. This contributes to the precarious situations uh, of the organizations that partner with us uh, and then the last thing, uh, which I have this bracket to it, is that community engagement and support are really critical to ensuring that an implementation trial stays relevant and viable. We could not have done it, and we could not still be doing what we're doing now if it were not for uh, the interest and involvement of the communities. So the peak, the peak for us, uh, maybe I should say for me, but I think for us team in general, is that the indomitable spirit and resilience of the community. They are not giving up. Uh, this says where there is will, there is the way. I think that is true, that the will to win reflects uh, the urgency that they see in the epidemic in their communities and their determination now to use science as a tool to tackle it and willing to, to partner with us to do that. We've been able to center community expertise and input at every level of 096. I've been astonished at just how involved uh, community members want to be, and we found a way to do that. And I think it's because they know what this is. Some of us may be surprised at some of the resistance that we find in communities, but they they work in the context of anti-Blackness <laughs> and privileging of whiteness all the time. They know what this is that we're dealing with. And so they're teaching us how to be agile in this environment because they know how to succeed despite the barriers that are uh, structurally in their way. 
uh, we've, we've framed the way that we've engaged communities as one that is relationship focused, not transaction focused. Being there because we believe in what they're doing and we support them, not what they're going to get from us in terms of recruitment or advertising. Uh, that's not how we want to be engaged with them. So we've, we've not done that. And then building capacity, we believe, has advanced equity in how we conduct the research process. So from our standpoint, equity has to be about how the network does its science, not just how we measure outcome variables. And so that has implications for who we partner with and how we invest in those partnerships. So some big ideas. Uh, I talked about this being a context that is quite complex uh, and a lot of uncertainty given this, the situation that's happening in many of these places. I think we should test new and experimental design methodologies that attempt to grapple with this complexity of real world implementation, not just control it uh, or try to box it out, but how do we grapple with this uh, and refine studies in ways that can respond to this type of complexity. We're tinkering around with one model like that, uh, it's called LAGO, or Learn As You Go, that can help us figure out what we can learn from the variation that will happen in implementation, the variation that can happen in implementation across uh, the study sites. We have to engage health business stakeholders in co-designing solutions to these structural barriers that actually undermine uh, PrEP and treatment impact. This can include healthcare corporations, finding business models that can sustain the bottom lines, uh, or health insurance. Dr. Sullivan talked about the, the need to have more people on health insurance. I agree with that. I think there are also other strategies that, again, that getting insurance alone won't solve. Uh, if a provider thinks that the, a, a, a particular product should be first line, we don't want insurers to say, let them fail on product A before we allow them to be covered under product B, because failure in this sense could mean an HIV infection. We can't afford that in the context where the prevalence among Black MSM is so high. And then we have to integrate, find ways, I think, uh, to integrate political strategy into our implementation strategies. What do I mean by that? So yes, we want, let's say for example, nurses, I'm a nurse. We want nurses to stop being racist and stop being homophobic. But we're gonna need a, di a different way to address that uh, without sort of saying that or approaching it head on. And that requires a particular type of political sophistication in terms of how we get folks to figure out or to agree to adhere to best practice guidelines. Maybe that's a better way to say it than stop being racist and homophobic. Uh, because structural interventions, by definition, violate the dominant social order, the social structure. That's what we're doing. We're engaging in a political process when we say we're going to implement a structural intervention. But then our strategies have to understand some political strategy. Uh, and we need to find ways to mobilize supporters politically and to neutralize and minimize resistance to the types of things that we're doing, which in some places are not going to be acceptable. We accept that. So in conclusion, implementing an integrated HIV prevention strategy for Black MSM has to acknowledge, anticipate, and respond to the realities of anti-Black racism and anti-LGBTQ stigma and discrimination. The healthcare marketplace has to be involved. We cannot ignore them. Market-based financial incentives might be able to expand equitable access to PrEP in the U.S. and indeed in the South. And then local communities, institutions, and the study teams are resilient and adaptable, uh, which makes success still possible even in the context of uh, extreme complexity and extraordinary uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. We hope that you can hang with us to the top of the hour, and I hope people are getting questions ready for our panelists. Thank you for that wonderful discussion. And a reminder that um, going into communities and working with those communities uh, may not be uh, uh, responsive to a straight line linear approach, uh, that we do have to respect those communities and approach them with humility and grace and adaptability and flexibility as we move along in these projects. So thank you for that reminder. Uh, we have our final speaker uh, for this morning's panel, who is Dr. Uh, Marsha Wong, 
who will discuss HIV and MPOX. Dr. Wong is an infectious disease physician and medical epidemiologist of the New York City uh, Department of Health. She has a background in HIV and sexually transmitted infections. Uh, Dr. Wong was a clinical and treatment subject matter expert during the 2022 MPOX outbreak, particularly for severe cases amongst people living with advanced HIV. And so we're very interested in her perspective this morning on our peaks and valleys. Welcome, Dr. Wong. Good morning. Thanks so much for the chance to speak today. It's an incredible privilege, especially as you all were so integral to the MPOX response last summer. Um, so I like, always like to start with the land acknowledgement. I want to start with acknowledging that we are on the unceded land of the indigenous Nacotchtank and Acostan people who lived here before and during the ongoing colonization of the Americas. We acknowledge the peoples who were stolen from their land and became enslaved in this one. We acknowledge these peoples, their displacement, dispossession, continued presence, and future. May we reflect on our responsibility to learn from the past as we contemplate a building a more just future. So this presentation reviews the epidemiology, uh, vaccination clinical presentation, and management of MPOX. So MPOX is a virus from the orthopox uh, virus family, and since May 2022, there's been transmission primarily through sex and intimate contact among MSM and other social networks. It's worth noting that this has been a neglected disease, and areas historically reporting cases in Central and Western Africa have received few resources despite decades of case reports and transmission. So worldwide, we've had, had 88,000 cases, 143 deaths, and pox continues to be a public health emergency of international concern, although cases are low compared to last summer. Here are the top 10 countries most affected. I've highlighted the countries where there are HPTN sites in orange. And here's the distribution of cases across the United States, with dark blue being the highest number of cases, with 42 deaths reported. So people living with HIV and people using PrEP are key populations affected by MPOX. In two sexual health clinic studies among those diagnosed with MPOX internationally and in Brazil, half were people living with HIV and one third were using PrEP. Of course, this represents a population that is highly engaged in care, uh, but many more people who are eligible for PrEP are not on PrEP and these populations also need to be reached as well. So Genios is the FDA approved, uh, is FDA approved for 18 and older in the United States is and is under emergency use authorization for those under 18. For the most part, it can be given at the same time as other vaccines with some minor considerations for COVID vaccine co-administration. This is largely theoretical. So vaccination coverage is estimated by calculating uh, M MSM who are on PrEP or living with HIV and increasing that number by 25% to account for additional people not in the first two categories. So over one million vaccines have been given in the US, but coverage is really low, with first dose coverage of 37% and second dose coverage of 23%, so less than one in four people um, in the risk population. Furthermore, this range varies greatly by state from anywhere from 5% to over 90%. Shout out to DC for having the highest <laughs> coverage. So there are also disparities across race and ethnicity. So when comparing vaccination to case ratios, you can see that those identifying as white have the highest vaccination rate. That's obviously the top dotted line. Um, for has have the highest vaccination rate for a number of cases, and black people having the lowest vaccination rates for a number of cases. So despite MPOX disproportionately affecting black and Hispanic communities, these same communities also have the lowest vaccination rates, leaving them vulnerable for a potential surge this summer. So here's the recent real-world real vaccine eff effectiveness data. Um, Sorry, the font size keeps changing. Um, the, with two dose vaccine effectiveness ranging from 66 to 89%, and one dose effectiveness ranging from 36 to 75%. So, getting both of these numbers up, both for first and second doses, in an effort to get population immunity as high as possible, is really key to preventing an MPOX surge. 
So who should be vaccinated for MPOX? So any gay, bisexual, or man who has, who has sex with men, transgender, non-binary, or gender diverse per person who's had an STI in the last six months or has more than one partner, anyone in the last six months who's had multiple or anonymous sex partners, uh, participates in group sex, uh, has had sex at a commercial venue or group event, uh, or who has a person who identifies, I'm sorry, who has a partner who identifies with any of the above. So really the partners are always what I'm a little bit more worried about. Uh, people who, also people who have HIV or are immunosuppressed, this vaccine is not contraindicated and should be given. Um, as you will see, they are, they are at high risk for bad outcomes if they do become infected with, with MPOX. So key populations uh, include people living with HIV or eligible for PrEP, and depending on your local epidemiology, I would argue that anyone, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, who tests positive for gonorrhea or syphilis is PrEP eligible, and you should be thinking about MPOX and MPOX vaccination. Um, all these infections travel together, as you know, and so this is us because there's something about their social network that is putting them at risk. I'll just quickly remind people, it's, uh, Genios is also indicated for MPOX post-exposure and should be given as soon as possible. Um, so these services, STI testing, MPOX testing, MPOX treatment and vaccination, HIV testing and prevention should all be thought of together as part of package of routine sexual health services. I would encourage people to have a fun summer, celebrate, but also using all the tools we have to keep them healthy as part of their regular sexual health. Okay, so I'll quickly go over presentation. So uh, cases during the outbreak were atypical with little to no systemic symptoms, started with anogenital or oral rashes, likely representing where the exposure occurred. Uh, patients then proceeded to have systemic symptoms, although not always, and sometimes had further dissemination to lesions um, to other parts of the body. So presentations can be debilitating and pay painful, um, and bacterial superinfection was common. Uh, so HIV and recent STIs were common among those uh, diagnosed with MPOX, so it's important to do screening for people being seen for possible MPOX and also to prioritize this population for MPOX vaccination. So I'm quickly going to go over through some, sorry, quickly going to go through some examples of lesions. These are some skin lesions. And here are some exam examples of penile, oral, and anal rectal lesions. You can see how some of them have sort of the central umbilication and are usually firm to the touch. Okay. So most patients uh, will resolve on their own. They can be managed with supportive care and pain control. Um, lesions can be painful, so we recommend systemic pain control, you, um, including opioids or hospitalization if needed. Um, lesions should be kept clean, use topical benzocaine or lidocaine uh, for anogenital lesions or magic mouthwash for oral lesions and monitor for secondary bacterial infections. Proctitis, uh, this was our top reason for uh, starting MPOX antivirals in New York City. Um, we also recommend stool softeners and sitz baths. And for lesions close to the eye, you know, wash hands frequently, avoid touching the eyes, stop using contact lenses um, to really pre prevent the spread of MPOX to the eyes. So in terms of antiviral treatment, ticoverimat is available, although efficacy is unknown. Um, it should be used for two categories of patients. One, in patients with severe disease, so people who have sort of lesions in a sensitive area or in, are in severe pain or two, patients who have a high risk of severe disease, particularly people living with HIV, with low CD4, or, or who are not virally suppressed. So everyone needs to be informed of the STOMP trial. Participation is voluntary. There is a telemedicine option. Um, patients with severe disease should also be referred, although they will not be put on placebo. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, the clinic, there are clinical research sites opening soon in Brazil and Peru. Um, if a patient in the U.S. is unable to enroll in STOMP, ticoverimat can be obtained through the CDC if they meet criteria for treatment. So I'm just going to quickly go over some severe manifestations. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, MP so MPOX clinical outcomes in people living with HIV, whose HIV is well controlled, has not differed from people without HIV, uh, including hospitalizations, deaths, or ticoverimat treatment outcomes. 
So I'm gonna quickly go through severe manifestations. So in a global case series of almost 400 uh, cases of MPOX with a uh, CD4s less than 350, there are high rates of hospitalization. And for those with uh, CD4s under 100, close to 30% died. This rate of death greatly de decreased when you were above 100, with CD4 above 100. Um, and the greatest disease severity, hospitalization, and death occurred with those with CD4s less than 100. And in the US, even lower, less than 50, our most severe cases and deaths happened um, in, mostly in people with CD4s less than 50. Um, so similar, um, similar to reports nationally in New York City, we've had 11 severe cases, mostly young, black, non-Hispanic men living with advanced HIV, many who were in unstable housing, um, all had high viral loads, all were hospitalized, some for many months, and 54% died. Um, the following three slides do have some graphic images, so if you need to look away, um, you can. Okay, so just some examples of facial lesions um, that obliterated facial features. Um, here are some eye complications, um, MPOX over the eyelid. If you can read a CAT scan, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the, the eyeballs that are normally round in the CAT scan actually have become flattened. Um, and an and, uh, example of corneal melt. We've also had some uncontrollable large volume bleeding uh, from esophageal and rectal lesions. And on this slide, we have some before and after photos. Um, on the left, uh, some necrotic lesions, and then on the right, treatment with uh, intralesional and topical sedofavir, as well as debridement. Okay, so for severe disease, um, really the most, <laughs> I know I'm running out of time, but I'll go quickly. But basically, the most, you know, want to start treatment right away, st start ART right away. But the most important treatment for MPOX is ART. The, all the other treatments we're using really just buy you time until the patient has had immune reconstitution. This can take many, many months. So finally, as many of you have heard, there's been a cluster of cases in Chicago. A majority are fully vaccinated. Vaccine still remain, remains our most important uh, tool against MPOX, um, and it reduces symptoms and hospitalizations. All these cases were quite mild in people who were vaccinated. Um, and we also need to keep a low suspicion for testing for MPOX, even in those who have been vaccinated. Okay, so in conclusion, um, MPOX vaccination and care needs to be integrated into routine sexual health care, um, offered vaccine to anyone uh, who might be at risk, particularly if you are seeing other STIs, because everything travels together. Um, treat symptoms and consider TPOX, refer everybody to STOP, um, and for those who are immunocompromised due to HIV, start treatment and uh, ART immediately. Uh, and prevention is key. Everybody who is eligible needs to be vaccinated to prevent a summer surge and also to protect those who are most vulnerable. Okay, I want to acknowledge the inspiring care, compassion, and strength of our provider community, who many of you belong to, who confronted a multitude of challenges last summer, their patients and their families, who even in the face of incredible suffering, still sought to contribute to our knowledge among the, amidst the uncertainty of a re-emerging disease, and special thanks to those who contributed slides to this presentation. Finally, I also want to acknowledge the trauma that this disease has inflicted and want to condemn the anti-LGBTQ and anti-trans policies that have been violent to this community and their loved ones and families. May we all lean into the joy that is Pride Month um, and Juneteenth and say together that we celebrate you, love you, and stand with you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wan. And actually, I do appreciate you sharing. The, it's difficult to see the pictures, but it's important to understand uh, the, the severe cases that you've been involved in treating. So uh, thank you uh, for your uh, presentation. We do have about nine minutes or so for questions, and I see we have questions. And so I'm gonna start here, and then we're going to go there. Fred, and then we'll come back to the center, okay? Go right ahead. Thanks, I'm Robert Klitzman from Columbia University. I'm a member of the Ethics Working Group for HBTN. Uh, thank you so much for great presentations. Uh, for Dr. Sullivan, I was struck by two things you said. One is that an, uh, a mobile app would be great, but the federal government can't do it. And I was wondering if you can elaborate on what kind of challenges, because that seems like another important, important sort of 
potential intervention. And, and secondly, if I can ask, uh, the other thing that struck me was the, um, the fact that there's a lack of PrEP providers in the area that needs it most in Atlanta. And I was wondering also, resonating with what um, Dr. Nelson said, how might that best be addressed? Thanks. Um, so, so I wanna, um, I wanna choose words uh, because I think this, this issue of how we take mobile apps and, and put them out so that they can be used by actual people who would benefit from them is, is really complicated. Um, and, and what I'll say, uh, my understanding of, uh, uh, I'm not speaking for CDC, but I, I think part of the challenge is that these apps keep some personal information um, and the federal government doesn't want that information and we don't necessarily want the federal government to have that information. So it really has to be someplace that is separated from federal data systems. And at the same time, it's extremely expensive to build and maintain the, if you wanna be able to go to the app store, download an app, have health information in it that's protected the way we want it protected, um, and then link to delivering these services, it's just, I, I don't know of the mechanism that has the sufficient resources. So what I'm suggesting is rather than advocating for an app um, to say, could we have a place, imagine I go into a community-based organization, the, um, the worker there asked me some questions and then they, they put it in and they say, actually there's three apps that, that might benefit you. This one you can order HIV tests and STI tests at home. This one you can get condoms, lube and, and find a place. This one you can have a tele, tele uh, health counseling. Which do you want? And then they put me on that app um, so that it is sort of a public platform for things that meet that level of, um, you know, that level of evidence but it needs to have the, the arm's length from federal government because of FOIA and, and data security. So I, I just think it's a, I think I, it's not clear to me who, um, like who's in that space, so. And the second question was? How to work with the lack of yeah. prep providers. The, the, lack, of, the lack of prep providers, um, you know, I think there's multiple ways to handle this. One is we have to keep looking city by city at where these gaps are. Um, and it may be that there are people who will provide PrEP but aren't in the national PrEP provider directory, which is another, you know, discussion. But then I also think thinking about telehealth, there's um, ongoing trial, concluding trials about completely providing um, PrEP through telemedicine virtually and adherence. There are some commercial services that are already doing this. And so I think we have to look at some implementation pieces of who that, to whom that's acceptable. Sometimes there are lurking little issues like that medication is going to be shipped and I'm concerned about who shares my mail drop or in my apartment. And so some of the ways we've addressed that with the home testing kits is just telling people up front, your kits will come from Amazon. The box will say Amazon. And when people hear that, they're like, cool, there's always 42 Amazon boxes, you know, piled and nobody's going to notice that. But there may be just some really simple implementation things that assure people if they use telemedicine prep um, that their privacy will be protected. Thank you. Uh, briefly, please. Sure. Uh, my question, I'm Fred Mazik. I'm the CWG member and CAD member for the Fenway Institute. And I have a question for Fenway's former scholar, Dr. Nelson. Uh, while there's a lack of equity between when it comes to medical care, it's fair to say that black MSN in the southeastern part of the country has a little bit less ability to access medical care. Can you speak on the parallel between black MSN in the country versus those in the southeast? I don't know if Dr. Nelson is still with us. Laron, are you there? Here. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Hey. I didn't fully understand the question though, but uh, it was about the parallels among black MSM in the Southeast versus the rest of the country. Correct. Yes. Well, I guess I will say from a, uh, there are a couple things that I think we notice is that there's not a main difference in interest and willingness to engage in, in some of these innovations like prep or treatment. I think what we find is that in the, southern part, and Dr. Sullivan sort of talked about this, the ways in which some of these things are structured make it more difficult. So Medicaid expansion is one example. It's, it's, it is harder if you can't get access to, to sort of public health insurance to get some of the things done like you could do in a place like Massachusetts or uh, the state of New York. Uh, I think the, the, 
tolerance of and normalization, I think, of anti-LGBT stigmatizing attitudes is also something that is different. Uh, not, not in every situation, but I think the ways in which black men can be in their communities and sometimes in healthcare spaces is, is different than when they're in the South. There's some things, especially in smaller communities, that you just are not going to disclose, especially if the provider doesn't ask you or they, the question is, uh, have you, how many women have you had sex with? Or do you have, do you have a girlfriend? Or have you had, if, if the answer to the question, how many women you have sex with is zero, then the person assumes that you're not having sex, but that might not be the case. But then what do you do in that context when as a black man, we know providers are less likely to even ask black men about their, about their sexual diversity. The assumption of heterosexuality, I think, is, is common. And I think in some places where anti-LGBT stigma and racism is sort of normal, when I say normal, growing up in a place where I know there are certain things that white providers who are normally who I saw would say to me, that is kind of just kind of how it goes here. It doesn't mean you're resigned to it. It means you have a choice to not get care or to get care in a place that's going to, that you're not going to feel good about. I think those are the differences. I don't see much differences between the men themselves, the individuals. I think the differences are the environment and the social processes and the degree to which they are allowable. And in some cases, uh, what would you call it, promulgated. We have examples of stuff that's happening in Florida where one of our study sites is or Texas or in, you pick a state uh, that is happening. I think the, the regional differences in the politics and the social situations are what is accounting for what we see, not that there's anything different about black men in the South or the North or the West. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mayor. Hi, Ken, Ken Mayor, Fenway, Harvard. Um, two questions. Um, really great presentations, everyone. So for Patrick, the South is so, somewhat heterogeneous, too, and one of, one of the big elephants in the room is insurance status. So I'm just curious if you use PrepView to interrogate um, states that have expanded the Affordable Care Act or have PrEP DAP programs versus states that haven't and, and how that affects the PrEP to need ratio. And for Dr. Wong, um, we were in a position of scarcity last year with the Ginyos vaccine, and so the recommendation was only two, um, you know, two vaccinations was the complete series. But the Chicago data are somewhat disquieting that so many of those individuals had been vaccinated, and particularly for people living with HIV. I just wonder what your thoughts are about a booster dose uh, this hot summer. So um, if, I, if I got the question right, the, I think there is this sort of intersection and uh, a kind of confounding in the Southeast between bad policies. Um, and there are also different um, the transportation uh, access as I think a piece of this. I didn't show a map, but there are substantial parts of the South where there are long driving times. And uh, so, but I think that the, so the analysis that was done around PrepDAP and Medicaid expansion uh, really is an ecological analysis, but it just showed that states that had both of those policy expansions had substantially better equitable PrEP use, um, and states that had one or the other had an intermediate level of equitable PrEP use, and the worst level of equitable PrEP use is in states that had none. So, uh, and uh, as you point out, both the, um, the states that have not yet expanded Medicaid tend to be in the South, uh, and there's also substantially less um, you know, sort of less prep debt program. So I think that it's an ecological signal, which is epidemiologists, we always want to like give you 42 caveats about that. But at a high level, it's a signal that when you're taking steps to engage people in healthcare and defray those costs associated with prep, that equitable prep use gets better. So I think sometimes something can be a simple explanation, um, make sense and be true. And the question is like, one, how do we move um, politics, so that's beyond my pay grade, um, and uh, and are there other workarounds that get, that move those same levers? Thank you, and Dr. Wong. Yeah, I think that's a great question, one that we don't totally have an answer to. So far, I will say Chicago has been an anomaly. We have not seen clusters so far in other um, jurisdictions. We're keeping a very close eye, including New York City. Um, so far, epidemiologic curves have remained the same. Um, which meaning very low. Um, I was just discussing this more with uh, John Brooks, who I think is in this room, so he may know more information, but uh, right now it's still two doses. Um, and I think the key really in, you know, maybe not in Chicago, but in many other jurisdictions is really to get first and second doses in 
people who have not gotten any vaccine, remember uh, only one in four have gotten their two doses. And so that really should be, you know, going to sort of those marginalized and, um, or not marginalized, just, uh, I guess, people who don't have access. And I can't say our vaccine rollout was equitable. I think there's a lot of work to be done um, in reaching those who have not gotten any vaccine. Um, you know, will there be a future recommendation? Um, I think we're still seeing what, what Chicago is uh, going to end up um, sort of doing. Um, but I think, uh, you know, right now the recommendation is still two doses. That may change um, over the course of the summer. Okay, I'm gonna keep going until I'm kicked off. Right over here, what's your question? Hi, I'm Dr. Jesse Heitner, SDMC. I'm one of your mathematical modelers, particularly uh, the one that does health economics and econometrics. Um, I'm gonna take off that hat and just speak as a, an MSM community member for a moment. Um, it always amazes me how many uh, talks I see about reaching MSM with PrEP um, that don't mention two keywords, but particularly one about uh, M health that doesn't use two keywords, and those are grinder and tender, because no, no matter how many people, how many clinics, how many governments we partner with um, to find MSM occasionally seeking care, if we're not looking at the two or three apps where we are on a daily basis, those of us seeking new partners, turning to find partners, um, we're not doing the efficient partnering, particularly when we're talking about mobile health apps. So um, my question is for Dr. Sullivan, uh, what are you aware of and what have we tried in terms of reaching out to um, those, those large dating apps where MSM are finding each other and you leveraging them? I've seen some interface on Grindr, it's not great, um, but there could be so much more and, and to me that's the obvious place to do an mHealth intervention. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that comment. And I will say that um, we've had, we're in a, uh, a, a partnership currently uh, with Grinder around um, test kit distribution, where those test kits can be accessed directly through kind of a persistent um, bu uh, button sort of early on in, in Grinder work sequence. And there have been, I think, some other attempts to, in, in, uh, to integrate some commercial uh, links to commercial uh, teleprep services as well. So that is um, that is happening. I think the question is um, the the deeper integration of all the pieces that are associated with the efficacy of these, which is helping men figure out like, do I you know, uh, do I meet the criteria for prep now? And if not, will you remind me in a, a few months to check again? I think those are are bigger investments that that change the user experience. So I do think it has to be a dialogue because uh, the, these companies are also also businesses um, and all and also have costs to the programming. So, I, but there is collaboration, and I think it's been a successful collaboration in terms of the availability of the test kits. And I think we need to look for opportunities to expand those kind of collaborations. Thank you. We, thank you. Thank you. We do need to close. We have to move on. But uh, let's get a round of applause for our presenters, Dr. Wong. We thank you, Dr. Sullivan. We thank you, and Dr. Nelson, we thank you deeply. And I just want to give a shout out to Eric Miller, um, who is the Senior Communications Director at FHI 360, who did pull this uh, panel together uh, remotely. We thank you, Eric, for your work. <laughs> The next uh, panel comes on. I think this has been very stimulating. I hope that those of you who have questions can find our presenters before throughout the day. And I hope this has inspired people to think about how we can uh, think big uh, and address the peaks and valleys that pose barriers to linking resources to those who can most benefit from them. So thank you all. Thank you. Well, good morning again, and it's great to see everyone here in the room, and, uh, and I hope you um, 
have really uh, enjoyed yesterday's uh, presentations the whole day, as well as meetings and also today's uh, remarkable session that we just had. Uh, thank you, Melissa, and thank you for the speakers. It was really uh, quite a memorable session. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to move on to our next session, and I'm very happy and relieved to see that everybody's here, <laughs> which is good, uh, which makes it uh, uh, hopefully uh, allows for even more vibrant uh, conversations. So our next session is entitled uh, Global HIV Research Priorities, and I think in this session we're going to hear two presentations, and then we'll have, we want to, we have, we're hoping to have sufficient time, I know we'll have sufficient time uh, to be able to have a conversation and uh, and uh, amongst the, uh, the, pres the speakers, as well as also um, uh, including uh, Cheryl Zwerski, who many of you, of course, know. So um, I'm going to introduce very briefly our first speaker, Irum Zaidi. And uh, Irum is somebody I've known personally for many, many years uh, in her capacity as Deputy Coordinator for Program Results and Impact Monitoring for Epidemic Control at at the, um, at the U.S. Department of State, and particularly, of course, in PEPFAR. Uh, she, uh, this title sounds, uh, is very long, but I think it, uh, if I can articulate it in a succinct way, is Irum uh, is amazing at um, really uh, putting in place many of the metrics uh, that have uh, enabled the success, the measurement of the success of PEPFAR as an, a remarkable global program, as well as also has been instrumental to examining these data and using the data to inspire action at a global as well as a national level. Uh, so um, I'm also going to next introduce our next, uh, the following speaker, so then you can just follow each other and are also honored to have with us today uh, uh, an old friend of the HPTN, a long-standing friend, not old, long-standing friend of the HPTN, and that's uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Merman, John o. Merman, and he's the director of the National Center for HIV, Viral Hepatitis, STDs, and TB Prevention at the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control. And uh, many of us have worked with Jono for many decades. I myself included, and uh, also just to let you know that also uh, Jono does have global experience. He served as a CDC director in Kenya and before that in Uganda, so he also has global and domestic and global experience. And then last but not least, obviously, is uh, Cheryl Zworski, known to us, obviously, at the network. And uh, Cheryl is the director of the Prevention Sciences Program at the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Division of AIDS. And she has uh, been the backbone of uh, support and guidance uh, for this network uh, since it's, since, you know, I don't remember how, how long ago you joined uh, AIDS, but um, a long time ago. Okay, a long time ago. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's wonderful to have you here and we appreciate very much your day-to-day -day guidance and, and advocacy and support for this network. Okay, without further ado, I hand the stage over to Irum. Thank you. Thank you, Wafa, and good morning, everyone. We're going to go a million miles away from the United States and talk about what's happening globally in the HIV pandemic. And uh, I don't know if my slides are up. Yes, they are, great. What I'm really gonna talk about is how do we sustain HIV impact globally? There's a lot of successes, there are challenges that we're facing, and in this dynamic state, and I think a lot of the conversations that were happening in the, net, in the previous plenary apply, but in different ways globally. So um, if you love data, you're gonna love this talk, hopefully. I'm gonna have a lot of data and I'll go through it quickly, but want to just start with some basic concepts. In our PEPFAR program, and I know many of you um, are involved in a variety of ways in implementation of PEPFAR and studies across the world, we're driving towards the UNAIDS goals of 95, 95, 95 meaning 95% of those who have HIV know their status, 95% of them are on treatment, and 95% are virally suppressed, which is really 85% of people living with HIV are virally suppressed. How awesome is that? And we're getting there in many countries. So, uh, right, I think I'm gonna have to wear my glasses. Ugh. Okay, so um, what we see here is on our left, 2022, where we were last year, 
and saying, where are we and what needs to change to get to this 25 goal? What needs to change by country, by population, by county, by district? Who, where, what, why, in the most granular level? So all the things we were just talking about in the previous plan domestically, we're doing across our 55 countries in PEPFAR. I want to thank ICAP for a lot of the recent studies that we've done, the public health HIV impact assessments. And I'm just showing two examples here, and I'm going to get into some of these country specifics in just a little bit. But we've done two of these household surveys, um, one in Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland, and in Uganda. And what you can see, what you can see hopefully, is um, on the left, Eswatini has reached, uh, I can't see any of those numbers. It's a real shame. <laughs> As you age, you don't think any of this will happen to you, but it does, just to let you know. <laughs> or can you please, or can they make it? Can you switch the slides to have the current slide to the right instead of to the left, please? Can you have both screens show the slides? Yeah, perfect, uh, thank you. All right, so what we see in the bar graphs that are going to the left are prevalence. The bottom one is uh, the first FIA in Eswatini, we've had three rounds, so that's FIA 2. And then the top one is FIA 3, so 2016 and then 2021. What we did in 2016, this was a baseline to say where are our gaps, where are our population gaps, where are our geographic gaps, and then we surged into each of these, adapting new interventions, implementing, failing fast, and going very quickly. And then what you can see on the right are the clinical outcomes. In the first FIA in 2016, again, I'm just gonna go through these, now everybody knows 95, 95, 95. In the 15 to 24 year olds in that first round, 15 to 24 year olds, 60% of them knew their status. And this is gonna be important in just a minute. That was for the males. Females, 76%. 25 to 34 year olds, 69, 84, 85. Women, you know, these are women childbearing age. They come in for um, uh, antenatal care. 91% of them knew their status, 86, 91. But then if you jump to the next round, five short years later, you see that for men, we were able to get to that 93, 96, 87. Females, 84, 97, 91, for 15 to 24 year olds. Still a lot of work to do for the men 25 to 34, but you can see for each of those populations by getting that granular information, we're able to work with communities, adapt programs quickly and work with them to have these better outcomes for themselves and for the overall country. In Uganda, it's a little bit more complicated. In Uganda, you see that there's been less progress in that 15 to 24 year old population, and I'll come to that in just a minute. Similarly for the 25 to 34 year old men and women. So we have to examine, and then even the 35 to 49 year olds, these are real risks. There is a youth bulge that's happening across East Africa, and we haven't even seen uh, the majority of it yet. So I've organized this talk. I'm just gonna go through the first three slides to show the patterns. So just look at patterns as we go through these countries. So these first set of countries are countries that are near or at 95, 95, 95. Who would have thought Botswana, a country of over 30% prevalence, people were dying, coffins in the streets, is now at a place of 95, 98, 98. Can we just, how, that's amazing. People are thriving, their businesses are thriving, their GDP, you know, everybody had a hit from the pandemic and that's complicated. But what you can also see, unfortunately, so in the blue line is new infections, orange line is all cause mortality among people living with HIV. Here you can see the COVID impact among people living with HIV and the deaths during that time period. So from a epidemiologic perspective, from a health system perspective, Botswana is at a place where they have a decreased number of people living with HIV, 
prevalence through natural causes and unfortunately other conditions are starting to decrease over time. So out to 2030, Botswana will be in a different situation. Now the next pattern I'm going to show you is new infections among 15 to 24 year olds, males and females. Now this is important to say how far do we need to drive new infections? Um, okay, it's back. How far do we need to continue to drive new infections? Because this continues to be a risk and again in another countries you'll see why. But even with being at a controlled state, meaning we don't have more people living with HIV day after day after day. We have a decline. Nevertheless, there are about 4,000, 5,000 new infections occurring. Um, hope, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. It's a little cut off on the left. The third piece in here is uh, the population pyramid. And what is happening with the overall population in each of these countries? And I've highlighted in the box uh, sexual debut. Is the pointer possible or not? This one here, and you have to point to okay, I can do that. one of the screens. Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to take a moment here. This box here is age at sexual debut, and for you know, some countries they go up or down, but somewhere between 16 and 17 is age at sexual debut. What's important is to say, all right, this is what it is now. But 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what should we expect? All right, so everybody knows the three patterns. Let's go through the data quickly. Eswatini, similar, declining. New infections, also declining. Not as closed as um, Botswana. But sexual debut here, and you can see the impact of um, uh, uh, HIV and AIDS deaths here. But here, you know, kind of in a steady state but still work to do. Namibia, similar, still has a lot of work to do to get the new infections among females lower, but they have uh, an annual growth rate of about 2%. Malawi, controlled. Uh, new infections coming down and that gap between adolescent girls and young boys closing quickly, but they have a youth bulge that's coming. So this is a concern in Malawi. So even though those new infections are coming down, there is this population that we have not seen and are we adapting to them? Zimbabwe, again, who would have thought in Zimbabwe we could be at a control state and not in an out outsized epidemic? And the impact here among females and males, astonishing. A little concerning here, and again, something to watch. It's about a third more people coming into sexual debut. So these countries that are near 95, we have amazing aging cohorts. About 30% of the population is above 50, thriving HIV positive individuals. There's a youth bulge that's a little bit in these countries. The volume of clients, how is our health system adapting? I think we heard a lot about that in the Southeast where I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. It's not acceptable, we need to do better. Uh, HIV awareness and prevention, social media, social media, social media. And agile prep service delivery, because again, we have not, you know, we're learning as we go and we're gonna get there. All right, those were good news stories. Striving towards 95. Mozambique, high disease burden. They finally understood their epidemic and they're racing. Over the past three years, they've scaled up. They're at 70, 95, 97. And you can see uh, they're unfortunately still, number of people living with HIV is growing, growing, growing until they can get their new infections and mortality to cross. Big gap in new infections among females and males, 15 to 24. And they've got a youth bulge. So this, is, this could be a recipe for disaster, but I think we have the tools, we've learned from our other countries, and there's possibilities here not to let that overtake us. So this scale is very different from what we saw in Botswana. The scale here and the number of new infections is 200,000. 200,000 new infections every year. That's not affordable to anybody. That's not affordable to the local health system. That's not uh, positive for the people who we need to protect from HIV acquisition. And what you can see here in new infections and in, um, adolescent girls and uh, adolescent boys and young men is this big gap. Again, something that has to be addressed 
their youth bulge, they've kind of gone through, and these are exaggerated. I cut it, I cut off the 70 above because it was this big, so that's why they look a little exaggerated if people are wondering what is going on. Um, uh, and this got cut off, but their growth rate is 1.9. Uganda, this is where I'm going to spend the most of my time. And this has um, implications for Tanzania, and we're going to do a repeat uh, FIA in Kenya, and we'll understand what's happening in Kenya shortly. But this is very different than what we saw. We aren't even seeing these curves come together. They are now running parallel. New infections have stalled, mortality has stalled. New infections among 15 to 24 year olds, women, has stalled. Understanding and adapting and getting into these communities is critical because this youth bulge, 3.2%, that's a dividend no, we're not seeing in the United States. We're not seeing this dividend. Our dividend's going down. So this is also an intersection, particularly, I think Mozambique has different tools working for them. Uganda, over the past five years, hasn't really been able to get out of that cycle. Let's look at their FIA data in a little bit more detail. So what we see here, and this is a 2020 FIA, um, you, we still see differences and disparities between women and men. Um, we see that up until uh, age 30, women half, and even 30 to 34 year olds, two thirds HIV prevalence higher than um, their male counterparts. As they age, they come closer, but I don't think that's helpful either way. But when we look at that from the clinical outcomes perspective, so here is 95, 95, 95. The way this is laid out is a little confusing, apologies for that. But for women, we have 83, 84, 97, 92. For men, 76, 95, 91. Now, if you think about that, and you come to the right now to say, okay, what does this look like for circulating virus in a youth bulge situation? It's scary. When we look at 25 to 34 year old men, half of them are virally suppressed. And we have our youth bulge that's coming in. So we need solutions to find men, to adapt services, to keep, you know, we all need to have services that speak to us in our ways that we, uh, our busy lifestyles. And you see the de uh, geographic differences then across the country as well. On our left, we have HIV prevalence, and on the right, we have viral suppression, and you can see the differences where uh, you have higher, um, in Kampala, where we have higher disease burden and uh, a very urban uh, area with viral, uh, you know, 76% viral suppression. And then this maps out where the population changes are happening. I know I'm running out of time. I'm now gonna to go to the Philippines very quickly. Very different epidemic that is surfacing now in Asia. And there's an opportunity to stop it right now, but we're just watching it. The Philippines, so they have an amazing case surveillance system. Go to their website, look at their case data. Um, this, these aren't estimates. The slides I were showing were estimates from UNAIDS. Thank you very much, UNAIDS. These are from their case reports. In gray, um, you have uh, cases among 25 to 34 year olds, 15 to 24 year olds in orange, 35 to 49 in yellow, blue is 50 plus, and then other ages that are lower. These uh, colors will stay in the next, um, in the next situation. But 20, just think about this. These trends, and the trends matter, so we know where we were, we know where we're headed, and we need to stop that trend. This trend among 25 to 34 year olds is concerning in a country like the Philippines where it's a very large population. Um, you can see these trends, this is now percent of cases by age by year, and you see the, gray, the gray bar on the right is females at the top and then males at the bottom and you see that gray bar growing and growing and growing. Um, and the top five areas of the region have 75% of the disease burden, so very focused. This is the most shocking piece that we need to intervene now. Deaths 
among 25 to 34 year olds increasing. Deaths, people living with HIV. If we think about when did the infection occur, how long ago, and they're now dying. In the Philippines right now, there are only 26 places people can get a confirmed HIV diagnosis, 26. So that's step number one, those policies matter. Not just being in the hospital for symptomatic AIDS patients and being able to treat them. Indonesia, this is my last slide. Um, Similarly, again, policies matter. We see in Indonesia a plateau. We see AIDS-related deaths not decreasing like we saw in all the other countries I just showed. And you can see why. Their progress towards 95 is uh, at 42%. All right, so what's our frontier? How do we sustain? We need policies for the youth bulge talking about age of access, not age of consent, but age of access. We talked about where sexual debut is happening, age of access for services do not match. We need social media. We had a great conversation as this last panel. We need social media that's addressing and reaching the youth where they are. We need PrEP, we need HIV awareness and a whole series of people where HIV really isn't a reality or anything they think about and a health system capacity that can take care of a third more of the population coming in. And then for key populations in MSM, similar, but they have to be adapted. So 2030 and beyond. Again, UNAID's goal is to end HIV as a public health threat by 2030. I think we see uh, amazing places where that's achievable and we will get there and the rest of them. That requires 85% of people being virally suppressed by 25. We need adaptive, adaptive, adaptive. We need the data, the community to tell us what we're doing wrong and how we do it better so we can reach them in the ways that they need it. HIV treatment impact has been phenomenal. Nobody thought it would be, and here we are. Addressing increasing MSM, youth bulge, real-time policy changes, and we need to have agile services and civil unrest, conflict, natural disasters, and our changing population needs. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I really appreciate uh, Wafa and Mike inviting me and um, joining so many friends here at the HPTN meeting. And I, I, I wanted to, you know, because Dr. Zaidi gave such a great summary of data globally, I decided um, to mostly use data um, in my talk to reflect um, on, on ideas related to science prioritization and, and essentially what both how it relates to what we do as prevention scientists and what, what are we missing. So let's see. Could we narrow Button? Down? This is, we have to ask some questions. Ah, it's, it's multiple. Thank you. Um, so um, it's um, collaboration on the on the dais. Uh, so so I wanted to start off with first the, just a little bit of the state of the HIV epidemic, um, the continuum of public health and syndemic approaches to HIV as ways of conceptualizing how we prioritize what we choose to do high impact prevention science in the current era, and then to, to, to put it together with the science um, and the gaps in how we know what to do that will maximally reduce health inequities. Um, so first, th this is just a, a figure from UNAIDS showing that we have very substantial reductions in HIV incidence over the past two decades, but it's only by about 50%, and we still have 1.5 million new infections every year. So we have a lot of new infections, and I think as, as um, Iram highlighted, we, we aren't where we need to be yet, but we are in the right trajectory, just not fast enough. This is mortality globally related to, um, to HIV, and this is HIV-associated deaths, um, and what you can see is the same thing. Um, it's, it's dramatic reductions, that's because of testing and treatment and some behavior change, but it also um, is, is still unacceptable at 650,000 per year. So these are data from the US. We, we presented new surveillance data two weeks ago from, from, and what you can see on the left is kind of HIV incidence over the past uh, uh, 12 years. And what you can see is that we started um, with some reductions. And, and during that time, what we ended up doing was reprioritizing what we were focusing on in prevention. So we were, we were reaching communities in most need. We focused um, less on individual behavioral interventions and more towards using some of the new biomedical tools. And we saw reductions of about 
18%, but then it leveled off. And then starting in about 2017, we've started to have this strong trend towards reducing incidents. Again, this is in the right direction, but far too slow. Um, uh, I will say, however, because of the expense of, of treating P HIV, that, um, that, we, that just assuming level um, HIV incidents compared to what we saw, we've had well over $15 billion of healthcare costs saved. And, and, and in HIV, we can argue that prevention, um, good prevention almost always is cost saving. So we save lives, we save money at the same time if we do good prevention. On the right, you can see that during the same time, estimated HIV prevalence in the United States has gone up to about 1.2 million people. That's because we're doing a good job of diagnosing and helping people on treatment. Um, and that number of people with HIV has actually doubled since 2000, or increased 50% since 2000. So what's happening is larger number of people with HIV with the potential to spread, but still a re reduction in incidence. So um, the, the idea of achieving what is in the global world is used as, is called epidemic control, is, is essentially extremely hard in the US because we have very low um, mortality rates um, among people due to HIV and among people with HIV. So on the left is just this red curve showing um, deaths among people with HIV, and you can see it plummeted with the, uh, very rapidly with the onset of highly active antiretroviral therapy. And it continues to go down. Um, but on the right, you can see a, a figure that shows the split between those that where they were associated with HIV, the felt was HIV on the death certificate was the cause, and that's on, uh, a little over 4,000. Um, but we have the, now uh, uh, the, most of the mortality among people with HIV is due to other causes. So this is kind of an ideal situation from a care standpoint, um, uh, and we still have prevention to do. Um, and then I wanted to highlight here just, th these are, I applied some of the data from our recent instance uh, from different states, and I'm showing that everything is not the same. The country's not the same. If you look at different states, some HIV incidents went up, um, and, and many HIV incidents went down. But I would ask that it, not only does it differ by state, it differs within states. It differs within cities and neighborhoods within these areas. And we don't spend enough time thinking about why that's happening. And I think we have an obligation as prevention scientists to, to both ask the question and be asked the question, why is it different? Why are some countries different? Why are some areas and countries different? Why are, as the provinces that were shown, or the districts um, in the prior presentation, but also within those, what's going on in those communities, both geographically and other populations, and how do we learn from that? And this next slide, um, again, is just most recent instance data applied for MSM in the United States. And when I started in my job, um, the, the highest incidence um, um, of HIV by far in the United States was among young black African American, young black or African American MSM. Um, and as you can see, it's below the age of 24. And you can see on the left, that was purple. And it was, it was staggeringly high and incredibly important. And we spent an enormous amount of time, energy, money trying to think about what was happening. And you can see that it's plummeted since then um, with a, a, a almost a 50% reduction in incidence. Um, however, you can see that by age, um, th there, it's not following all the same patterns among um, Hispanic Latinos, black or African Americans, or whites. And, and we have to ask the question, why? Why are we successful in some groups? Why aren't we in others? Where are we bringing services? And what's the science behind learning from this? And I think a lot of the previous presentations from Dr. Nelson, Dr. Sullivan, others highlighted we have to be able to answer these questions. And that is a role, I think, for all of us. Um, so, so now, what is high impact prevention science right now for HIV? Um, and I, want, I have two slides on this topic. So for the first is kind of, I, I, I laid on the left kind of the, the, the research along a continuum of public health. So basic research, I'm gonna leave aside a little bit. I'm hoping it's advancing great things. Um, but I, a lot of our work is, is, is following that. It's what are the applied research and clinical trials that need to be done that will answer the questions that we need to have answers two to five years from now? If you're answering a question that's relevant now, your study shouldn't be conducted. And, and, and so then we have, we have this continuum of operational research, pilot projects, program implementation, and policy change. And I will posit that we do too much in the middle and not enough at the end. And that a lot of our demonstration projects or pilot projects are heavily invested programs that almost always work and very rarely are brought to scale afterwards. If we are honest with ourselves, and I, I, you know, I feel like I'm in a 12-step program, I've been involved in several of these where I was so proud and I loved working on these projects. 
and they were published, several, several papers, and then they never were brought to scale. And so the question is, why? Well, I think the answer for us is just as like a single pill for PrEP or a single pill for, um, for treatment, you know, makes it easier for patients or individuals, we have to think the same way from a public health standpoint. What are the interventions we're working on that are so simple and easy that they will be implemented. Simplicity matters. Um, and so I have a list of stuff that you know, we're all working on right now, multiplex diagnostics to make testing easier. Well, thinking about that along this continuum, where are we, what are we doing, and, and when we go to the far end, bottom of this continuum of public health, will we have something that can be implemented, and will we have the science to tell us how to do it? Um, and the second way to think about kind of prioritizing science is to get a better clicker. No, is, um, is, is to actually, is to think from a syndemic approach. And the, and, and the way I think about it, there are four categories from a syndemic. So syndemics are like badnesses you know, colliding in, in, in populations that are, you know, often people highlight social determinants of health, but it can be, it can be other kinds of, um, of, of processes or infections that are kind of combining in different groups. What I like to say is synde a syndemic approach, I like to think from a positive standpoint. What can we do? more holistically that will make a bigger difference in people's lives um, for our goals in public health. So one is people. Put your money where your epidemic is. So make sure that your resources are with the populations and the places where, where actually people have, you know, are. And, and, that you're, and if you're not doing that, you get some of the disparities that we're seeing. Um, in an unequal society, disparities will naturally occur until you fight against them. That's what we've seen with HIV, we saw it with MPOX. It would have been worse with MPOX because we started, but we were not as successful as we could have been. The second is, is geography, as I mentioned, it matters. Um, the third is, is, is kind of scientific questions. Are we answering questions that will, are we developing diagnostic tools or treatment tools that will make it easier for populations um, so that if I'm going to a, a single venue, will it make a difference? An STI clinic, do they have PrEP? and HIV treatment, do they also have STI treatment? Are we providing doxypep? Are there other things that can be done that will look more holistically at a population or an individual? And then the, the fourth is really related to policies. And this is areas where, again, I think we probably aren't doing enough from the scientific standpoint. And I'll highlight some later on, but you know, what are the policies that work? Um, if you were gonna implement things, and that can be in an institution, like routine HIV or hepatitis C screening in your hospital, but can also be Medicaid expansion or LGBTQ laws or things that are supportive of making a difference from, from a syndemic standpoint. So I know HBTN future. I know it's going to be either implementing a vaccine or implementing a cure. And that is ideal, but we don't have either of them. So we're stuck with what we have. And I'm highlighting these slides very briefly Wafa, well, I'm not going to go over my 12 minutes, is that, is that first, um, we should be able to, to test and treat ourselves out, out of the epidemic. We've published that, we've proven it, but we're not done yet. We should be able to prevent all new HIV infections or prevent acquisition through pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is about 99% effective. Syringe service programs, which reduce HIV and hepatitis C by at least 50%, um, or behavior change. Condoms work if you use them. So, but we still have new incidents. And then we should be able to detect outbreaks and prevent new infections. We've shown from CC that if you, we, if you find an outbreak that the, the spread of HIV in these clusters are 10 times faster than in the nation as a whole. And we have great success stories uh, in Atlanta of working with the Latino MSM population where we brought testing, we brought treatment, we brought PrEP, we stopped the outbreak from occurring by working with the community um, but we detect far more outbreaks than we're able to actually respond effectively to. And then um, I think either there's a talk already or there will be a talk on, on, on the, kind of the interaction of STDs and HIV. We know it in our world. We know that, that um, you know, having a gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis doubles your risk of acquisition and doubles your risk of transmission of HIV. In the United States, we have a massive growing STI epidemic. It, this is the eighth year of increasing STIs. I think this is a problem for HIV prevention. And I think it's also a potential solution. The better we can do with STI prevention, the better we're gonna, it's gonna be an easier enabling environment for HIV prevention, whether that's implementing doxypep and where guidelines are being reviewed right now, or potentially Bexero vaccine, if it ends up working. There's, we need to have better interventions for STIs and it is directly correlated with HIV prevention. And then 
my last kind of thing is that how do we nudge towards success? How do we make it so that we set up that enabling environment that, um, that, that makes it easy for people to actually have prevention occur? A lot of that is structural. Make, make, the, make them available, whether it's having these, inter, you know, these long acting agents, um, these interventions that are going to make it so that people's you know, adherence changes from taking a pill a day um, or even taking an injection every two months to going to the doctor once a year for an implant or, or once every six months for an, an injection. And, and I think that we have to think always about that as our endpoint. If we're doing anything along the continuum of public health, when do we get to the point where we're nudging towards success and can we take that intervention and know that we're going to put in the, the structures that are going to make that happen? I also wanted to highlight the positive use of digital media. We don't do this enough. I know that you know Dr. Sullivan had mentioned it earlier. We do have great access when Grinder used our our you know our um, our uh, um, Take Me Home app. We had lots of people ordering testing. We have um, we, they have put on a widget for us where we can people can access HIV testing or, or prep providers. Um, but there's so much more. There's so much more that we can do positively with digital media than we do, and, and there's a scientific gap there about how we can be effective. Um, the, the second area is, is something that Dr. El Sadr and I um, um, had the opportunity to, to work on at Croy um, this year. It was a session on thinking proactively about the world of information, disinformation, and misinformation from a scientific standpoint. What we, you, I know there's a, a session that, that Waf is holding um, uh, at this meeting tomorrow, um, and, and, and the issue is it's fascinating gaps in what we don't know. Um, there's very little work that says, if you are going to bring out a new intervention, this is how you can do it in a way that will prevent misinformation or disinformation. Because otherwise, what we end up doing is going backwards. And I am saying it's not just come out credible you know, first and, 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 and correct. This is a far different concept of how we use the entire social media and regular media universe. And it is far more effective if we do this well than putting up you know, posters and bus stops. Um, I mean, when you, when you ordered boots yesterday, your spouse has it on their, you know, their link when they went into Amazon. We need to think about that. Like, that's, that's our world. We, we, have, we have tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. Why aren't we using the same techniques that, that the business community is using for public health issues? And I think it's, um, I would argue that a lot of it is that um, we don't know the answers and we aren't running the studies. Is that for me? That's for you. Okay, so I'm almost done. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm highlighting... I'm highlighting here the policy. Level. I wanted to tease the group here with gaps in policies. So first, um, housing, healthcare, substance use, mental health, they're all kind of, however you look at it, either social determinants or personal determinants of health. Being homeless is associated with the two and a half times higher odds of having a detectable viral load. Um, receiving Ryan White services was associated with increased viral suppression. And medication-assisted therapy decreases HIV incidence by about 50% among people who inject drugs and improves viral suppression. Where there's one randomized trial of housing for people with HIV, um, and, and only one, and I'm just arguing here, we talk about SDOH all the time. We talk about equity, but we don't do studies of these policy changes in a proactive, structured way, and I think we could. The second is, sorry, thanks, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing on this actually, but I appreciate the applause, is the structural stigma in policies affect health. So sexual minorities who live in areas with the most structural LGBT stigma experience higher mortality than their heterosexual counterparts. In addition, LGBTQ protective laws um, were associated with a two to three percent lower mortality among people with HIV. So there's true data to indicate that these structural environments can have positive or negative effects. And yet, last week, the Uganda president, Museveni, signed an anti-gay law that includes the death penalty as a punishment. And I want to highlight that this matters for people's life and death, and it matters for our prevention world. When was the last time someone in HBTN went and consulted with a government about this type of policy change? Oh, well, almost done. Guidelines matter. And I wanted to, this is truly my last slide, um, I wanted to say that, that, that um, I also think if we really want to treat equity seriously, we have to understand how to measure it. So this slide I actually developed 10 years ago, and it showed that, um, that relative disparities in HIV-associated mortality went up 
between blacks and whites in the United States when highly active antiretroviral therapy came out. And I said, this is terrible. We have to work against this. And then I learned that actually, we knew at the time there was a 90% reduction in mortality for everybody in the United States with HIV when ART came out. So what happened is the natural thing that relative disparities go up when absolute disparities go down when you're, when you're decreasing issues. This almost always happens when you're measuring trends in disparities. And so the question is, who knew that in this room? Who knows that, that, that this, when we, when we highlight data, are we, are we using you know, the correct equity science? Are we thinking about how that, what that matters to us and how can we prevent both of these from happening? From, we wanna make sure there's absolute reductions and we wanna make sure relative reductions are occurring. Um, and we want to think about that proactively to prevent it from occurring, um, both in our studies and in our measurement. And I am done with my talk. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Irum, and thank you very much, Jono. And, um, and I know we could have spent many, many more hours talking about this. I think we're, I'm going to sort of just try to have a panel discussion and then we might have a few minutes for some questions. But before we start the panel conversation, I'm just going to ask uh, Cheryl if you have kind of some ref quick reflections based on what you've heard. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, Wafa had asked me um, earlier to speak a little bit about NIAID's priorities. I think most of you are very aware, well aware of what they are in the area of prevention. And then to kind of talk about how that ties together with both what Iram and um, Jono talked about this morning. And I think that it definitely does dovetail nicely. Um, you know, we definitely, as, as Jono pointed out, an HIV vaccine is still a high priority for the Institute, but um, as he said, given where we are, what else are we going to focus on? Um, Long-acting antiretrovirals can tend to continue to be a focus. Um, that said, choice is really important to us, and I know that it's important to, to you and the populations um, who need HIV prevention, so we really try and keep that in mind. Um, the, you know, are we looking at um, long-acting delivery, not only, pro not only products, but delivery systems, improving those? Can we extend the duration of action that we currently have, I think is, is going to be really important. Um, one of the questions that we're very committed to is can we generate the information that's needed to advance broadly neutralizing antibodies? Um, I don't know the, question, the answer to that, but I think we're d dedicated to answering that question. Um, you know, looking at inclusion of pregnant women, that is really definitely a prior, as soon as possible into our step prevention studies, is definitely a priority. Um, we were working with the WHO and IMPACT. There was a call to action back at the end of 2021 that we were very much involved in and want to support those principles, both in our treatment and prevention studies. And I think we're gonna have some opportunities, hopefully we have had and will continue to in this in this network and some of the others. Um, you know, Jono mentioned syndemics. Clearly, that's important in a syndemics approach. That's very important, as you can see with a number of our studies, HBT and 096, of course, that Laurent talked about this morning, as well as others recognizing that, that there are, that's multifactorial. And um, I, I want to, at this moment, really mention our, our partners that do this work together. I mean, we really can't take that kind of approach on our own. We have to work with um, NIMH, um, NIDA, as well as NICHD and OAR. They're very closely involved um, in everything we do. Um, of course, we work with CDC, we work with PEPFAR, Pharma Partners, other foundations to really try and accomplish the work that we do. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that one of my takeaways, or a couple of the big takeaways to me from the talks this morning, is that we need to really deliver, um, deliver prep um, modalities that decrease the burden on the healthcare system and are as simple as possible. I mean, I think, I know we've been thinking about this for a while, but it, that I think in both of these talks that was very much brought home, home to me 
is, and the other piece is, there's a lot of good news in this data on the one hand, on the other, as, as the, um, they have both pointed out, it's not necessarily even that progress. And I think that means that we then have to be even more targeted, laser focused on populations um, at most at need and in need still. And that's, that's no small task. I mean, that, that is a complicated um, piece of work, but I think that it's absolutely incumbent on us to really try and find better ways to, to find people, to interact with them, and to really engage for the long term. Our community partnership is absolutely critical to doing that. Um, and I think that the more complex this situation gets, the more critical that engagement becomes. Um, uh, again, I, I think that looking at, um, you know, John o brought up, uh, publication is great um, when we do these projects, and of course we all want that, but really we have to ask ourselves, even at the very beginning of a concept when we're formulating it, how, what is going to happen with this information? What will we do with this information? Will it change care? Will it be implement, implemented? We can't necessarily know all the answers to that in the beginning, but I think keeping our eyes on that prize and making it as simple as we can is, is really going to be important. So I'll stop. For Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was very comprehensive and very helpful. Uh, I'm going to look now to Iram and Jono, and I feel like we have the local and global sitting next to each other here. And we always talk about this idea of bi-directional learning. I mean, I feel like I have one foot in New York and Harlem and, one, and the Bronx and another foot elsewhere. And just you listening to each other, I'm just wondering kind of what are, um, are there things that, um, uh, that you hadn't thought about before that all of a sudden kind of rise to the top in terms of how do we tackle the domestic epidemic with its peculiarities and where it's most severe? And also similarly, you know, for you in terms of what are aspects of the uh, U.S. response that that could be um, that you could uh, take to PEPFAR. I will start with you, Jono, and let your thoughts. My first thought is I wish Aaron went first. Um, no, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, for, I, so first, I actually think we can learn all the time from within our countries and across countries. So, mm -hmm. so I'm struck from some of the discussions here, you know, people talk about the South or different parts of the United States, that we have many different communities, both geographically and from other kind of population measures. And to learn from what's going on in those different communities is the way we're going to continually improve. Um, from Iram's powerful kind of large scale perspective, the question I've always <clears throat> asked is, how did they get there? Like truly, I mean, we do, we, we're better than most countries in terms of the proportion of people who know their HIV status, who have, you know, the people who have mm -hmm. HIV know their status. But we do much worse in terms of the ultimate viral suppression rates. Um, even though I think CDC's measurements still underestimate the truth, it's still, we're, we're probably mm -hmm. lower. Um, and so the question is, how does that, how did what, did, what did so many of these countries, what were they able to do that made it so easy for people with HIV to, to get treatment and stay on it? Um, I also have the science, in my question of maybe it's high mortality rates and so people aren't getting the treatment but they're between fears they're dying or something else is going on. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but the other thing is actually just jealousy. I, I have, I have je <laughs> We're jealousy. We're envious. So <laughs> I, I want to learn quickly so I can imitate. Okay. And that's where research questions can come in as well. Uh, Irum, what about from your perspective? I mean, now there's an appreciation that key populations are a good proportion of, a large proportion of the new HIV infections, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, like 50%. So what can we learn from the U.S. and what are questions we should be asking? Yeah. Um, but let me respond to yours. I think there's two pieces in the United States. One, our healthcare system is just not functional, right? HIV or not HIV. Uh, if I'm, we're all very busy trying to get an appointment that is six months out and remembering I need to show up six months from now, it doesn't help anybody. So we have to simplify service delivery in the United States. We were able to do that in many of our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where the health system didn't exist. 
where it was episodic care. The longest time somebody received any services was for TB or if you were pregnant. So we had to build the chronic disease system in all of our sub-Saharan African countries. In the beginning, patients were coming on a monthly basis because we didn't have enough drugs, because there weren't enough providers, there wasn't enough personnel. But over time, by community, we looked at where are those issues and adapted those sites and communities and service delivery models to now people are coming once a year and we have enough drugs. That's amazing. That that requires the policies you were talking about, the adaptability, engaging community, and providers to make those changes. So happy mm -hmm. to talk, and there wasn't a lot of more. Talent. And and maybe I can <laughs> actually uh, maybe you can give a hand to all the people from those amazing countries in oh, sub-Saharan yeah. Africa that accomplished this, <laughs> and many of them are here. So. Go ahead. I would say um, two, two things about key populations. One, UNAIDS is going to update those estimates because yeah. they're a little shaky. Yeah. So we're going to wait for that update. But regardless of that, I think what's happening in Asia is very concerning. Would love to hear um, in those places that you show decreasing mm -hmm. incidents among MSM, what actually occurred? How did you get into those communities? Because it's a treatment and it's a prep thing. But right now, everybody... PrEP is sexy, let's get PrEP done. But that mortality means there is a lot mm -hmm. of undiagnosed new infections, and how do we address that? So mm -hmm. we'd love to hear those successes domestically that we could take um, to Asia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll uh, move on to another issue that was highlighted, and um, I think it's, it's fascinating to see the um, the data, international data, the, the data you shared, Irum, and how um, it's such at the micro level, like it's almost at a um, at a very fine level, and um, and and the and the um, the drive to meeting targets um, is is very explicit in PEFAR. And I'm wondering, Jonah, from your perspective, is do you feel like that's? I mean, how much of how much of should we be looking at, like telling our communities, wait a minute, in the United States, you have X number of people in your community who are probably undiagnosed with HIV and help them, help them access service. So what do you think about that? The issue of balancing the data, the disaggregation of data and how targets should drive the work. So, so we, um, I think the fragmented healthcare system and the, and the fact that, that there, you know, in, in PEPFAR, such a large amount of resources came with targets, and there was mm -hmm. the ability to make a difference um, and to essentially and, and to centralize a lot of activities that then became decentralized. Um, in the U.S., we do, we're still we're kind of a small component of a much larger public health, it, you know, system issue, whatever. So I think that that makes it harder. However, we do have you know, we do present data by state when and 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 sometimes um, more recently by now the ending the HIV epidemic community. So we do have some data, and we try to like have um, the the different states look to each other and say, I wish I could do better for this indicator. So we do have some indicators. Um, but I think the, the issue is that um, sometimes people can ignore those and still get their money. So, ah. so, it's, so, it's, so, so it's, it's a hard thing. Also, so, you know, so I it's think the, having the goals are important. Stick and the, what is it, the stick and the carrot. Carrot, carrot yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or, or ice cream. And maybe we need ice cream instead of a carrot. Mm. And then people will be more willing. To, yeah. to really get there, but I but I do think we we have some successes with indicators, and I think for um, we we try to do the same thing with MPOX vaccination, um, mm -hmm. as you saw in the presentation earlier today. Yeah. Um, that that there is some of that, um, and I think, but but I actually again, it's another space for envy. Mm -hmm. um, is the, is is the success in many of these countries that they've been able to do? Yeah, and it is maybe the coming together and sharing experiences and creating learning networks, maybe. Uh, Cheryl, in. Uh, you, you articulated very nicely the priorities for NIAID and for DAIDS and so on, and for the other uh, institutes as well. And um, we know that the epidemic is changing also and evolving over time and in terms of the epidemiology and so on. And uh, what do you think or how do you feel is the best way to, or what is the current, what are the current mechanisms for kind of adjusting as we're going based on new data, new priorities, new gaps, and so on. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. 
Um, obviously, we have to do that, and that is not necessarily always easy when we have these large ships that we, um, you know, that we've built and that are very, very um, important to the work, you know, um, achieving the work we're doing. But I do think we have to be continually be asking ourselves, okay, is where we're focusing now really, you know, I mean, that's what we were thinking, yeah. um, you know, in the past, and that made sense, but how do we take this new information that has just come out and again ascertain how to find the populations that are most in need. Um, I wish I knew the answers to that but those are the questions that I, I think we need to be asking. As a matter of fact, I was talking to one of my colleagues this morning about us and Endades having a series of conversations mm -hmm. about this very thing and where are we now, how do we need to adjust. Another interesting um, element that came up actually um, in one of your presentations was this idea, this concept that innovation, sometimes discoveries, can aggravate disparities if we're not careful. Um, and, um, and the importance that I think you mentioned, uh, Cheryl, of uh, understanding or really engaging the science of scale-up so we don't aggravate um, uh, disparities and uh, I think scaling is not simple and what we've learned from many countries is that actually there's a science of scaling and uh, how do you think can we bring the research um, uh, the research um, enterprise into study of scale up and maybe I'll John, I'm looking at you first, and then I'll go to your own next. You and that. <laughs> exactly. Do you want to start, Walt? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm the moderator today. <laughs> we can talk about that later, but go ahead, uh, John. You know, so, so one thing, you know, um, you know, Mitch Warren uh, talked to me uh, about the idea of having, you know, options and choices, and I think there's that next step of how do you make those choices. Um, uh, very, you know, easy and positive in the in the long run for people. So, um, I, I do think that the that um, it, it's probably impossible to prevent some of the disparities that occur with the introduction of new interventions, regardless of where they're happening. But keeping an eye on it and proactively ensuring that you reduce that and that you rapidly bring the interventions to the people who need it the most to prevent those disparities from getting bigger and ideally rapidly decreasing them is possible. It's, and so I think thinking about that as we do, and, and then the science, you can look at some of these areas where we didn't have the problem. You can look at some of the successes in the past just retrospectively, and we have some modelers who are very keen to do this. But then the question is proactively having structured studies that deal with that kind of intervention. So um, we, 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 they tend to be expensive if they're conducted the way that we normally conduct studies, but I don't know if they always have to be. Um, there's an interesting um, yeah. uh, example in, in, um, in smoking, where in the yes. United States about 10 years ago when they introduced a new campaign called TIPS, uh, TIPS from Former Spokers, um, they ended up doing it in different communities based on the media um, uh, kind of coverage, and they were able to show that it had a differential effect by essentially a stepwise um, intervention design, and I'm wondering if there's some areas for that for yeah. us as well. Thank you. Irum, do you have any thoughts on that? Just a lot of our um, innovation had to be in service delivery mm -hmm. because that mo a chronic disease system did not exist. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of boutique programs, I think you were maybe referring to some of those in your talk as well, uh, that were great in one district or with one community, but that wasn't getting us to the population impact. So. I think a lot of it is dynamic. I, I don't know the science and research around that, but it has to be an applied public health approach is what I would say, and I will turn it over to you because I think we're out of time. Yes, we are out of time, uh, but nonetheless, I think um, I want to kind of leave you with some thoughts before we end this session and move on to the next session. I think what we heard today is, uh, and this is my own summation, is the importance of, maybe the importance of bi-directional learning across countries, between countries is very, very important in regions. I think the importance of having data and uh, data at uh, complete and accurate data with the granularity to be able to inform the actions and the, and the research itself. 
Uh, I think we heard that it's important to have targets and to have a stick and a carrot uh, associated with those targets. Uh, I heard today the, uh, the distinction that Iran made between age of access uh, and eight age of consent, and I like that concept. We struggled in this network in terms of providing access to um, youth, and we saw from all the data that youth are often left behind, but this idea of age of access versus age of consent is something that I will keep in mind. The youth bulge is something also to, to think about, and uh, thinking what's going to happen next is important. Um, and then aligning, uh, obviously aligning our research agenda to the data and to the epidemic, current epidemic and anticipated epidemic is very important. Uh, the science of scale up um, also was mentioned. And also this idea of being aware and beware that uh, our innovations do not, um, um, do not um, exacer ex exacerbate exacerbate uh, the disparities and the distinction between availability versus access is very important. And I also want to go back to something Laurent said in the previous session, is that um, we often, in our research agenda, we focus on the individuals, and I think Laurent made a very compelling argument that, yes, we have to focus on the individuals and so on, but we also have to acknowledge that people live within systems and communities and societies, and uh, we need to uh, learn and study that and how that influences how we achieve uh, equity. So thank you very much. I want to thank this wonderful panel today and, uh, and invite Mike to come up to the podium. Okay, um, quickly, this is probably one of the more important um, and gratifying but also sad moments in our meeting. Uh, there'll be a set of slides, I think. Is that correct, uh, whoever's got the slides? Yes. So, let, let me ask a question. How many in this room knew Ward Cates? Please raise your hand. Okay, so as I suspected, about 30% of you knew Ward Cates. So, let me, let me explain. 30 years ago, this is our 30th anniversary, believe it or not, 30 years ago, when many of you were maybe not born, <laughs> 30 years ago, Ward Cates, this very remarkable visionary man, <clears throat> saw that HIV vaccine development would be difficult, if not impossible, and he was prescient in that way, and he said, well, there's got to be other things we can do to prevent HIV, and he convinced the uh, the federal government, it wasn't just the NIH, he convinced the federal government to start a network called HIVNET. And over all these years, this network, HIVNET, involved to this meeting we're at today, the PTN Award, <coughs> the PTN uh, Network. Ward Cates died at a young age <coughs> um, in 2016. We thought a lot about what could we do, and we decided to honor Ward's memory uh, with this Ward Cates Spirit Award. So just a few words about Ward Cates. He was born in 1942 in Cleveland, Ohio. He was raised in Rye, New York. He was a great tennis player, taught tennis, uh, and he was charming and he was funny. Every time he'd, he'd be in the room, he'd say, hey guys, that would be his, his way of introducing himself to you. He went to college at Yale and was very loyal <coughs> to Yale his whole life. He married Joan Roberts. They had two daughters and he has four grandchildren. So getting to, yeah, I think some, somehow an, a whole other award came up from another meeting I don't, on, this, on this screen. Um, so what was Ward like? He, he was an incredible champion of public health and women's health, internationally recognized leader and mentor, generous to an extreme. He worked for the CDC from 1974 till 1994 when he moved to Family Health International, where he worked for the remainder of his life. He was the author of a large number of publications, served on editorial boards, and received many, many awards. I think remarkably at this time, in the at least in world history, in the United States history, Ward's first job at the CDC was to examine the effects of um, the Roe v. Wade decision where he, in three years, wrote 100 articles showing that the availability of abortion in the United States reduced maternal mor mortality by massive amounts. And this obviously made him an incredible figure and also a target for, those, for this controversial issue. But Ward 
Ward was a brilliant scholar. So what we do is accept nominations for anyone on our network who we feel has the characteristics that we think Ward would have appreciated. Commitment and leadership to health is a right, both internationally and domestically. Scientific excellence and rigor. And, and, and this man was so disciplined in his review of articles and, and, and in science. Um, generosity in, in virtually every aspect of his life. Personal uh, values of integrity, honesty, loyalty, unwavering uh, commitment to what is right, compassion, and, and really valiant advocacy for the rights of others. As you can see, he was my best friend. <laughs> so this is a picture of Ward, um, and I think that conveys what he looked like. Well, if you'll agree. And so we've given this award. We've given it to wonderful people in this room. Ken Mayer, Sten Vermund, Quraysh Abdul Karim, the late and great James Hakim. If I can go forward. Tom Fleming, who started the network with Ward. Beatrice Grinstein with us today, and Kathy Hansen, who worked with us for her entire career and helped organize the network. We, we kind of um, guard who gets this award. So who gets it this year? None of you know. Somebody's getting it. Um, <laughs> and no one knows who's getting it, and it's going to be Rafi Landovitz. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no, there's no cash value. Rafi's my great friend. There's no cash value. There's just a clock. However, <laughs> it is an inscribed clock. So Rafi, can you come up here? Because we'll also make a few comments. It's, all of you know this. All of you know this talented young man from his work. Um, for the last 10 years on Capitagraver and Long Acting Prep, he serves a huge role at UCLA and is you know, now taking over uh, the direction of their Infectious Disease Division. He served a role in their, in their uh, care organization, the CIFAR. He's been recognized for the, for the exact characteristics of Ward. So. So to, to say that this is uh, an indescribable honor uh, is the world's biggest understatement. Um, I, I, d I never knew Ward, uh, but I've heard incredible tales of his generosity of spirit, of mentoring, um, of advocacy uh, for human rights. Um, and I think he would remind us today um, that that legacy is ever more important in today's political divisiveness uh, and the climate that we're all trying to take the spirit of what he began forward. Um, that words matter, that pronouns matter, that choice matters, that equity matters. Um, it's an incredible honor uh, to receive this award and stand with the previous recipients of this award um, and I will endeavor to be worthy of it. Thank you. Unless I'm told otherwise by Nero, I think we have a break now. And a 10 minute break? 10 minute break. Please come back because we have a fantastic session to follow. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. I'd like to ask everybody to sit down, if they would, so we can get started and stay close to schedule. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the, to the Laboratory, Laboratory Center Plenary, the LC Plenary. 
And um, we have three speakers today, and um, I think it'll be a, a great session uh, picking up on some of the topics from um, earlier in the meeting. Um, our first speaker is Mark Marzinki. He, with me, is co-PI of the HBTN Lab Center. He's a professor of pathology and medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. He's a board-certified clinical chemist and is a CLIA director of the Clinical Pharmacology and Analytic Laboratory um, within the Division of Clinical Pharmacology at Hopkins. He also directs the Automated Clinical Chemistry Lab at Johns Hopkins Hospital and leads um, our HPTN Lab Center Pharmacology Corps and also the Clinical Laboratory Corps for the Hopkins Center for AIDS Research. Um, and today Mark is going to talk about inclusion of gender diverse populations in clinical trials, lab assessments among transgender women enrolled in HPTN 083. So I welcome Mark. All right, so good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Eshelman for the opportunity to present today. And much of the work discussed herein is presented on behalf of the HBTN 083 study team. So the primary take home message of this presentation, which I think was demonstrated well by HBTN 083 and you know, through many conversations that we've had both at this meeting and over the last several years, is that studies of PrEP should be designed and tailored to consider transgender women, not just extrapolated from studies in cisgender populations. Uh, transgender women, as well as transgender men and gender non-conforming individuals should be included and represented in PrEP research. I promise I'll figure out the clicker. Okay, and we're, we're back on board. Okay, so uh, trans women are disproportionately affected by HIV with a global prevalence of 19.9%, which is 66-fold higher than the prevalence among the general population uh, of individuals aged 15 and older. HIV infections among trans women are highest in Latin America, followed by Asia and North America. PrEP, rep PrEP represents a significant opportunity for improving health within transgender and gender diverse communities, but marginalization within the public health system, medical and research mistrust, knowing one's status and stigma uh, are all barriers to PrEP initiation. For example, challenges in the uptake and persistence of oral TDF FTC for PrEP have been observed among trans women in PrEP demonstration and efficacy trials. And while several of these barriers may also be experienced by other populations, an additional concern amongst transgender and gender diverse populations is the potential impact of PrEP on gender affirming hormone therapies. Despite the prominent role of hormone therapies in transgender medicine, pharmacologic gaps exist, particularly with respect to drug-drug or drug-hormone interactions. So when we think of evaluating drug-hormone interactions, could we go back to the previous slide? Perfect, okay. Um, so when we think about drug-drug uh, interactions, what should we uh, consider? So one would need to be cognizant of the route and delivery mechanism, so oral versus long acting, as well as the biological target that you're looking at, you know, uh, intraerythrocytic drug concentrations, plasma, things of that nature, right? So we think, have to think about the study product, we have to think about the specimen source, but then we also have to think about the timing of when sampling is gonna occur, and obviously that's gonna be contextualized by both the uh, study product and the uh, specimen source. Another consideration is the directionality of the interaction that you're assessing, because that might inform both the study design or population uh, included in the evaluation. Right. So I think I'm off a little bit on the note, so if you can maybe take care of that. But um, on this slide, uh, we had performed some preliminary work interrogating the potential interaction between gender-affirming hormone therapy and TDF, FTC for PrEP. So we investigated whether tenofovir, emtricitabine, and their intracellular adenabolite pharmacokinetics in plasma peripheral blood mononuclear cells and colonic tissue differed in trans women on gender-affirming hormone therapy as compared to cisgender men. And this was done as a small pilot project uh, that was uh, funded in part by the Johns Hopkins CIFAR. 
So we enrolled eight trans women and eight cis men. Uh, trans women trended towards slightly higher BMI. They were younger in age. And there was variability in terms of the gender-affirming hormone therapies that were accessed, as well as uh, in estradiol concentrations. So study participants were offered uh, PrEP under direct observation for a week, and after last dose, plasma peripheral blood mononuclear cells and colonic tissue were collected to measure drug pharmacokinetics. And what's shown here in uh, this figure was that several pharmacologic parameters differed between populations. So trough tenofovir concentrations were 32% lower in trans women as compared to cis men, and the area under the curve trended 27% lower. The pharmacologic parameters observed in plasma emtricitabine were similar. However, differences in PBMC or colonic tissue concentrations did not differ between groups. So in parallel, a number of other studies have evaluated the potential relationship between estrogen-based gender-affirming hormone therapies and TDF-FTC. Similarly, these studies relied on directly observed therapy to reduce adherence confounders. Of note, and as illustrated on this table, there was a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the number of participants included in each study, the hormone regimens that were accessed, the specimen sources used to assess PrEP pharmacologic parameters, and just for ease, results that uh, showed statistically significant differences between transgender women on hormone therapies and comparator populations are denoted in red. While several studies show that there were reductions in tenofovir and FTC uh, pharmacologic parameters which corroborated some of our pilot work, not all of them did, right? There were several studies that showed that there was no statistically significant difference in drug exposures um, between transgender women on gender-affirming hormone therapy and comparator populations. And there were some studies that showed that there might have been slightly higher uh, exposures, right? So given the overall lack of consensus across studies, the heterogeneity in study designs and pharmacologic assessments, additional work is, is warranted in this area. So this then opens up the conversation for the inclusion of transgender and gender diverse populations in clinical trials. So this figure from a recent review uh, illustrates the interconnectedness of trial design, participant recruitment and enrollment, as well as participant uh, retention and engagement. Uh, chiefly, as you know, highlighted throughout this meeting and in meetings past, engagement and involvement of the community and really having our community stakeholders drive our science is, is critical. But then when we also think about clinical trial design and analysis, right, really building in uh, questions and considerations for the target population, and that may include, you know, things like drug hormone uh, interaction studies. Inclusivity is obviously very important, and while the FDA has published guidance documents to promote clinical trial diversity, they don't specifically call out the inclusion of transgender and gender diverse people in clinical trials. So to segue a little bit now to HBTN 083 and 084, obviously study designs we're all pretty familiar with. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the study design and then the application with um, transgender women in the HBTN 083 study. So as a brief review, the study design included a five-week oral lead-in in which participants received daily oral CAB or TDF, FTC, and placebo pills. During the injection phase of the study, participants received uh, 600 milligrams of CAB as an intramuscular injection or placebo, a second injection four weeks later, and injections every eight weeks thereafter. Participants also received uh, TDF, FTC, or placebo pills to be taken daily. Participants who discontinued injections or completed the injection phase of the study were offered open label TDF FTC for 48 weeks, and the study schedule is summarized herein, and arrows denote the scheduled injection visits. The study was conducted across 43 sites, or at 43 sites across seven country, countries and four continents. An enrollment minimum of 10% transgender women was set, and our focus today will really be limited to the blinded phase of the trial uh, and focus on laboratory assessments. Of the 4,566 participants enrolled in the study, 570 were transgender women, which represents 12.5% of the cohort. 304 were randomized to the TDF-FTC arm and 266 to the CAB arm. However, there was heterogeneity in how transgender women self-identified, with 70.2% 
uh, identifying as transgender female. However, 15.8% identified as female, 7.5% as gender non-conforming, and 5.6% as gender queer. Trans women were prim primarily enrolled from Asia and Latin America, and at enrollment, the median age was 23 years. The enrollment prevalence of STIs was high across the entire cohort, and rates among trans women ranged from 6.9 to 16.8% for syphilis, rectal gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Throughout trial conduct, participants continued to be sexually active and had high rates of STIs. The incidence of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia was 16.3%, 11.7%, and 20.6% respectively. Nine transgender women acquired HIV during the blinded phase of the study, seven in the Truvada arm and two in the Cavitegravir arm. Overall incidence was 1.2 per 100 person years, and the broken down incidence rates were 1.8 per 100 person years for the TDF-50C arm and 0.54 per 100 person years for the CAB arm with a hazard ratio of 0.34. Of the two trans women who acquired HIV in the CAB arm, one acquired HIV during the cabotegravir oral lead-in, and then the other one acquired HIV 849 days after she received her last injection, and cabotegravir drug concentrations were unquantifiable at the first HIV positive visit. Among the seven seroconversions that occurred in the TDF-FTC arm, uh, none were associated with plasma tenofovir or intraerythrocytic tenofovir diphosphate concentrations associated with uh, prevention effective adherence at the first HIV positive visit. And the hazard ratio is consistent with the overall OA3 trial, which has been previously published. Drug concentrations were evaluated. Uh, in a randomly selected cohort of 389 participants randomized to the TDF-FTC arm to evaluate adherence to daily oral PrEP. Of those 389 participants, 49 self-identified as transgender women. For reference, tenofovir diphosphate concentrations from dried blood spots uh, above 700 femtomoles per punch are associated with more than four doses per week. And overall, 60.5% of evaluated samples had tenofovir diphosphate concentrations greater than 700 femtomoles uh, per punch. Tenofovir diphosphate adherence among the 49 women in this randomly selected uh, adherence cohort remained fairly consistent through week 57, with anywhere from 53 to 71% of evaluated samples above that threshold. Although hormone concentrations were not evaluated during the study, self-reported gender-affirming hormone therapy was captured at enrollment and during study conduct. At enrollment, 249, or 43.7% of trans women, reported accessing gender-affirming hormone therapy. An additional 14.2% reported gender-affirming hormone therapy use after enrollment. The frequency of reported estrogen, antiandrogenic, and progestogen uh, use was 93.9, 76.4, and 35.5% respectively. The most commonly reporting, reported gender-affirming hormone therapy regimens included estradiol valerate, spironolactone, estradiol, and ciproterone. And there were no differences in the types of gender-affirming hormone therapy regimens um, accessed between study arms. However, and importantly, gender-affirming hormone therapy was not only utilized by trans women in the study. 32 cisgender men reported gender-affirming hormone therapy use um, at enrollment 7 and then 25 um, after uh, enrollment. Estrogens were most commonly reported among these participants. And of note, you know, gender identity was only captured at enrollment, so more frequent asking about gender identity throughout the study um, could be considered because there's the acknowledgement that gender identity is not static. So as previously mentioned, evaluation of drug hormone interactions is an important consideration. So to begin evaluating this potential relationship or potential impact of gender-affirming hormone therapy on cabotegravir concentrations, select visits were evaluated from a subset of trans women randomized to the CAB study arm. Participants included in the analysis received all cabotegravir injections within plus or minus one week of a scheduled visit and had no missed injections through study week 57. 
and among our evaluated cohort, 30 trans women reported gender-affirming hormone therapy use and 23 did not. Among participants who reported gender-affirming hormone therapy use, the most common regimens were suproterin, estradiol valerate, uh, and spironolactone. And this table shows the geometric mean cabotegravir concentrations, as well as the 95% confidence intervals at evaluated time points. While cabotegravir concentrations were nominally higher in trans women accessing gender-affirming hormone therapy, there were no statistically significant differences in cabotegravir concentrations at evaluated time points. The overall p-value was 0.783. It should also be noted, however, that hormone dosing times were not captured and estradiol measurements were not performed, thus an impact of cabotegravir on gender-affirming hormone therapy was not assessed. I'm a visual person, so I like seeing the data graphically. And looking here, you know, I think you can note two things. One, that there is inter-individual variability in terms of observed drug concentrations. But I think most importantly, you can see that the, um, the two graphs for trans women accessing gender-affirming hormone therapy and those not really do overlap quite well. So to summarize, HIV incidence among trans women during the blinded phase of OE3 is consistent with overall study findings. Adherence to TDF-FTC, as defined as more than four doses per week, remained consistent through study week 57. Gender-affirming hormone therapy was self-reported by trans women as well as cisgender men at study enrollment and during study conduct. And cabotegravir concentrations among transgender women on gender-affirming hormone therapy, while nominally higher, were not statistically significant uh, or statistically significantly different between the populations. All right, so with that, I'd like to thank our funders, the HPTN OA3 study team, in particular, Dr. Beatrice Grinstein, who's been, to me, an outstanding leader, collaborator, and mentor on this work, and has been a champion uh, in this field for decades. I'd also like to thank our colleagues at DEEDS, GSK, Gilead, and HPTN leadership, and most importantly, the site, study participants, and site staff, so thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Dr. Alan Matubo. He's the laboratory director at the University of Zimbabwe Clinical um, Trials Research Center in Harare. He oversees lab support for clinical trials under the HPTN Impact, ACTG, HVTN, and MTN, and has more than 19 years of experience in clinical trials research. Today, he'll talk to us about procedures, challenges, and support systems for protocol-related testing at study sites. So welcome, Dr. Matubo. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the HPTN leadership uh, for this opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, and uh, the slides that I'm going to present to you over the next few minutes are a representation of uh, the very important and great work that is being done across multiple labs under the leadership of the HPTN Lab Center. So uh, my title uh, has been presented to you. There we go. Yeah, so I'm hoping uh, at the end of this presentation, I would have been able to sort of uh, present to you the role of a clinical safety lab in clinical trials and also share with you some of the operational challenges and the mitigatory measures uh, that these labs are continually putting in place to ensure uh, adequate support for HPT and uh, protocols. I also hope that uh, by the end of this presentation, I will have demonstrated uh, the synergistic, uh, that synergistic relationship between the lab and clinic teams is key to overall uh, clinical trial success, and that a well-coordinated uh, system is also key to ensure robust execution of uh, HIV prevention trials. So to start off, I just want to present to you this uh, 70, 70 rule which uh, some critics do not quite subscribe to, uh, which uh, says that 70% uh, of, of medical patient records are made of lab data, and also that 70% uh, of medical uh, decisions are based on lab results. But let's move closer to home. Uh, I think uh, to the audience here, 
when we talk of the role of uh, clinical uh, safety lab in clinical trials, I think we all agree in terms of uh, the role that the lab plays in the multiple um, um, uh, processes which lead uh, to execution of our protocols. And here I'm just going to look at uh, three which I think capture the whole uh, life of a protocol. We have got the pre-study, then you have got uh, during the study and the post-study period. So for all the protocols that we execute, we need to screen uh, and identify uh, the correct participants uh, given um, the enrollment criteria for each protocol. And it is quite key that the lab provides that service to be able to identify the participants who qualify for each of the, these protocols. And also, you want to enroll the correct participant, which is the basis upon which uh, your study can then be successful. You can be able to actually get uh, the, the outcome uh, of any investigational uh, product that you may be looking at. And when you are excluding participants based on lab results, it is quite important that those results be reliable. You don't want to have uh, some potential participants being excluded because of our spurious lab data, which can then maybe even affect your screen enrollment ratio. There are also some very critical decisions, which we have seen mostly with, um, I think, some of the protocols where we are looking at long-acting CAB, where you need to make start-stop decisions in terms of uh, product, um, uh, product displacement to the, to the participant. And at times, you want to rely on lab results, especially for maybe HIV diagnosis, for you to be able to make those decisions. So it is quite key during the study that the lab provides that kind of support for those decisions to be made. Clinical efficacy of our study products and study endpoint determination, again, that's a role where the lab comes in. When you look at post-study, analyzing composite adverse events, which may be based on safety data generated out of the lab. So you want to be really sure that the data that you are analyzing and making very important key policy decisions on is based on uh, data that, that, that has been generated by a, a robust uh, system. Okay, so in this slide, um, I just want to give you uh, a pictorial overview of the 24 African labs uh, which are operating under the guidance and leadership of the HPTN Lab Center. And it is under each of these labs uh, that all the processes that I'm going to describe to you in the upcoming slides are being undertaken. So um, we do have uh, different lab levels in terms of our lab support. We have got uh, the smaller labs which are mostly located right at the clinical research facilities. These provide on-site uh, point of care testing, uh, HIV rapid testing, um, pregnancy testing, urinalysis, uh, and uh, other rapid uh, STI testing. Then we also do have uh, centralized laboratories where we perform uh, the more complex uh, lab testing to include HIV confirmatory testing, uh, biochemical profiles, which is, quite, which is quite a key safety monitoring test, uh, full blood count as well as other tests which are listed. Then the HPTN also identifies other specialized laboratories where the more complex testing is then referred to uh, for some of them to include HIV resistance testing, which also is required for real-time uh, clinical management. And just to indicate that testing at each of these uh, lab laboratories is guided by protocol analyte list, which is a document generated uh, by the lab center and then populated by the individual laboratories which really provides all the testing methods which will be applied for a given protocol, and this has to be approved before implementation. So when we talk of uh, lab quality management systems, this is what uh, keeps us awake in the middle of the night. We are really trying to make sure that we satisfy those three parameters. So given the critical role that the lab plays uh, in decision making, it is quite critical to ensure that results that are generated out of the lab are accurate, they are precise, and they are reliable. And it is only through meeting all those three that we can really be sure that the data that we have generated and the outcomes that we are looking at out of our research is something that can be relied on. So when you look at uh, this, the ideal, um, the ideal that we want to achieve is to be able to have both high accuracy and high precision so that at any given time when you provide a result, you can be able to go back and if you test that same sample, you are able to reproduce that result and be able to provide some level of precision, accuracy, and, um, and reliability. 
So this diagram, uh, I think it touches everyone in this room because in as much as the lab is providing these results, there is a process which, um, which all of us partake, which really has got an, uh, a bearing in terms, of, uh, in terms of the results that are generated in the lab. So you've got the pre-analytic phase, you've got the analytic and the post-analytic, and it, it is quite important to note uh, the level of error that can actually okay at each of the three critical stages. And very importantly, again, to mention that um, up to 75% of some of the errors can actually okay before the actual testing has been done in the lab. So there are many stages where you can actually have uh, pre-analytic errors, which include the sample collection stage, uh, sample transportation, which is quite important, ensuring that you maintain the cold chain, uh, sample sorting on receipt within the testing lab, where mix-ups can happen as well if there are no adequate measures to make sure that uh, that does not happen. Sample processing itself, there are certain samples which are require pre-processing before they're actually tested on the different machines which are in the lab. So again, that is another critical stage uh, that um, needs to be looked out for in terms of avoiding um, uh, pre-analytic errors. The reagents that you actually use on the different types of equipment, there are storage conditions under which you need to maintain those reagents to make sure that when you actually do your testing, uh, the results that you get satisfy those three elements that I spoke to earlier on. When you move on to the analytic phase, uh, this speaks to your training, the personnel that are running the lab, are they well trained, are they competent to be able to discharge the duties for the different uh, tests that you perform? The environmental conditions, the equipment that you use, you have to operate within uh, specific environmental conditions, temperature uh, ranges, so that also comes into play in terms of really ensuring um, the quality of your results. The equipment that you use needs to be validated, when you get your equipment from the manufacturer, it's not a plug and go. You need to perform specific tests which can give you the reassurance that the equipment is performing as specified uh, by the manufacturer and also meets the requirements for the task that you want to apply that instrument to. And as you are using your instrument, there are also uh, requisite uh, preventive ma maintenance procedures that you need to perform, service calibration procedures that you have to be adhered to at the given frequencies, to make sure that uh, the piece of equipment is well taken care of. Then you also do have quality control that you also need to incorporate within your testing. This can be internal quality control or external quality control, which then gives you external validity to really be confident of the outcome uh, of your lab um, uh, testing. Uh, so if we move on to the post analytic, so once you have done your testing and everything else, uh, you've got your results, you have followed all the due processes leading to you generating your results, you can still get it wrong at the post-analytic phase where you now want to be able to report your results to the clinic. Uh, this is a stage where you've got a scientist who then reviews, looks at those results to make sure that they satisfy all the attributes of, uh, of an acceptable result, a reliable and a precise result. You review those results and you report them to the clinic. We also have uh, automatic uh, transfer of results where we have uh, lab equipment, which is interfaced to lab information systems where you automatically transmit your results. That's another process which if not properly validated, you can also have errors in terms of our results transmission. So you need to perform a validation and verification exercises to make sure that your electronic interface is actually transmitting results properly before you actually implement. And you need to continually check in terms of uh, the acceptable perf performance of, uh, of that interface. So those would uh, be some of the issues that you want to look out for um, in terms of our post-analytic uh, errors. So, in this slide, uh, it is by no means an exhaustive uh, list, but it touches on some of the key processes which are implemented across the different labs that I sort of uh, indicated earlier on, in terms of ensuring the quality uh, uh, for all the testing that we provide, staff training and competency, which is not a one-off event. You train, you assess for competency, then periodically you need to continually assess to make sure that the staff is still competent to be able to carry out that, uh, that task monitoring environmental conditions, uh, equipment validation, uh, phlebotomy, phlebotomy procedures, specimen chain of custody quite key to make sure that when specimens are transported from the point of collection to the lab, all these uh, conditions are, are met, sample acceptance and rejection criteria, 
Sometimes you get a call from the lab to say we are going to reject the sample that has been delivered. This is quite important to be able to protect the data that we generate because of all the testing that we do, there are certain conditions that the samples have to meet uh, for us to be assured of the uh, quality of the results. So that's very important for a lab to have a sample acceptance or rejection criteria in place. Uh, daily quality control, which I spoke to, which is um, what will then help us in terms of uh, tracking uh, equipment performance, it also tracks staff performance as well. Reagent load to load verification, so whenever you receive new reagents, you don't want to assume that the reagents that you have received are in good order. You also perform tests to make sure that they are in good working order before you actually use them to run uh, study samples. Uh, I, I scheduled equipment uh, service, which I also alluded to earlier on. And most critically, all the processes must be controlled and um, follow standard operating procedures so that one person does it today, the next person who comes in next week does it exactly the same way because they are following the same procedure. External quality assurance, where you receive um, uh, unknown samples from an external provider, known values to the provider but not to the lab staff. They run, they report their results, and you get graded. So it gives you external validity in terms of uh, the quality of the work that you are generating. And again, uh, reporting of results, and in, a, in some instances, maybe results may be recalled or cancelled. So there has to be clear uh, procedures for that. So here I'm just demonstrating one of the key tools that we use for monitoring equipment performance, which is the Levy Jennings charts. And what you see, each single dot that you see on that chart represents a result. And uh, this can be done to make sure that whenever you process internal controls to check the uh, performance of your equipment, you are able to track it over time. And here you have got uh, the first data points, which I have highlighted in green there which would show your mean, so that's the um, value that you would ideally want to get, but you then uh, you've got an allowance in terms, of a, in terms of standard deviation within which you, your instrument has to run. So this is typically what a good instrument would show in terms of uh, variability over time, but which is contained within uh, a range close to the mean. And once you get uh, something like that, you would want to investigate because this would uh, sort of be indication that those data points are pointing out to something that is problematic within the chain, either it's the instrument, it could be the reagents, it could be the personnel, so you need to really investigate whenever you get points which are falling away from um, the acceptable performance for the instrument. So some of the challenges, uh, especially uh, the COVID era uh, that uh, these labs have been running into relate to reagent supply chain, which also hinder uh, uh, projections in terms of uh, inventory. And to really go around uh, some of these challenges, uh, in co I mean, in, uh, in communication with uh, the key providers, we have also adopted uh, sharing yearly requirements to these suppliers so that they know well in advance what are your requirements are for, for, the, for, for the whole year, which then allows for them to plan with you in mind. Equipment method uh, performance uh, validation, at times you get your piece of equipment, you try to validate, but maybe something has gone wrong in transit, the equipment does not perform, you need to troubleshoot, document, and also um, uh, track the performance over time. Uh, at times, as we perform in uh, external quality assurance programs as well, you get those samples, you process them, you submit your results, but yeah, your results do not fall within the acceptable, um, acceptable range. So you need to investigate, troubleshoot, and as well uh, document and check performance over time. So one of the strategies that uh, labs have adopted uh, to be able to optimize the reagent inventory one of the worst nightmares for any lab is not to be able to provide testing because you do not have the necessary reagents. So to go around that, we have used available tools uh, like the um, uh, uh, schedule for evaluations, uh, study specific uh, documents to be able to pro project in terms of uh, what workload is anticipated. So once you have got a participant who is recruited into a study, you know all the study visits that are going to follow, you know all the tests that are going to be requested at each of those study visits. So through computing uh, in an Excel, you can actually be able to project reagents requirement for any participant who has been recruited at the point of recruitment because you know all the visits that will come and you know all the tests that will be required and you can then actually translate that to how much of reagents would you need, which then allows for forward planning. 
So I am hoping that uh, with these few slides, uh, you would agree with me that uh, the synergistic relationship that needs to be existing between the lab and the clinic is quite key to be able to uh, successfully execute a, a clinical trial and also that a well-structured and a resourced quality management system is also quite key in terms of our implementation of our HIV prevention trials. And that in this environment, especially during the COVID uh, period, you need innovative strategies to be able to sustain uh, adequate lab reagents and ensure that uh, there is uninterrupted uh, lead service. Thank you uh, for listening, and I want to acknowledge uh, the funders, uh, the HPTN leadership, and as well as the University of Zimbabwe Clinical Trials Research Center leadership. Thank you. Okay, and our last speaker today is uh, Dr. Matthew Hamill, who's a UK-trained physician specialized in diagnosing, treating, and preventing all, H all STIs, including HIV. He's clinically active at Johns Hopkins Medical Medicine and serves as clinical chief for um, STI services at the Baltimore um, City Health Department in, Bal uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. And his research focuses on uh, rapid diagnostics for HIV and STIs in resource-limited settings. And he'll be talking to us today about tackling the STI epidemic using the I Want the Kit program at home, self-collection, and mail-in testing for STIs. So welcome, Dr. Hamill. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to HPTN for the opportunity to um, describe how we can make some steps in tackling the uh, STI epidemic through at-home self-collection mail-in testing for STIs. And I'm going to use um, I Want the Kit, uh, which you'll learn more about in the next few minutes as an example of this. So the main message to take away from this presentation, or I hope that you'll take away from this presentation, are fourfold. The role of home-based testing to help address the uh, STI epidemic, it is not a panacea, of course, but goes um, some way to addressing um, STIs. The evolution of STI testing landscape in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, how home-based testing is an important piece of the implementation of STI testing, treatment, and prevention. And how an online platform can innovate and undertake surveillance activities. My disclosures are here, and the Johns Hopkins University Land Acknowledgement Statement um, is on the uh, lower half of this slide, uh, which I'll leave up for a few moments so that you can read. The objectives of this session are to describe changes in use of online home self-collection mail-in testing for STIs, to describe different models for self-collected mail-in STI testing, and identify future innovations using an online platform. So I'll first describe I Want the Kit, um, tell you a little bit about what it is and what it does, then talk about changes in I Want the Kit use since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Then I'll describe expansion of I Want the Kit services, its current and future plans for the platform, and finally, how I Want the Kit can be uh, leveraged for STI surveillance purposes. So this is a really brief history that absolutely doesn't do justice to the work um, that was involved in setting up and maintaining um, I Want the Kit. It was founded by the wonderful uh, Dr. Charlotte Gados at Johns Hopkins in 2014. And until 2011, it only served the state of Maryland. Uh, from uh, 2011, uh, the uh, geographical reach was expanded to include Alaska. And then in 2019, uh, Dr. Yuka Manabe, also from Hopkins, took over leadership of I Want the Kit. In 2020, Arizona was added, and as I'll show later on, there's been a large expansion geographically in 2023. Some of the uh, highlights, and I don't have time to go in, into all of them, um, 
that have, or some of the innovations, I should say, that have happened recently include uh, a new website that's available in English and Spanish. It's also available as a mobile app. Um, the results are now printable so that users can print them off and take them to their providers. We have automated um, reminders for women under the age of 25 to remind them about annual testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And also for anyone who has a positive STI test, we send them a reminder at three months to encourage them to repeat that test. So I want the kit is a, um, a six-stage uh, process, which I'll go through very briefly. Firstly, a user will establish a profile on a HIPAA-compliant website, and then they'll place their order. The kit is assembled and shipped out. It arrives in a very um, uh, discreet, brown-packaged um, envelope. In the kit uh, are uh, test instructions, as well as the um, equipment required um, in order to take the test. The user will self-collect these specimens and then mail them back in, um, also by USPS. When the package arrives back at the uh, CAP-certified International STD Laboratory at Hopkins, specimens will be received and tested, and results um, made available to the users within uh, two business days. And then the sixth step, and an important one, is um, that positive test results for chlamydia and gonorrhea will be reported, or are reported, I should say, to the relevant public health authorities. So I Want the Kit currently offers FDA-cleared tests for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis, the, 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 the latter on uh, female vaginal samples only at present. For users in certain jurisdictions, at-home oral fluid HIV antibody tests are also mailed out. Genital and extragenital sites can be tested, and the list of um, anatomical sites are there on the third bullet point down. Swabs are uh, flock swabs, which are transported in dry tubes. It's important to be aware that this is a cost-free exercise for users. There are no costs incurred by the user, including postage costs. The turnaround times are between one and two business days from from the order of the uh, from receipt of the order to the ship being to the kit being shipped, and then again less than two business days from the specimen being received in the lab to uh, results being posted. I want the kit is available to um, users aged 14 years and above, and as I'll show you in a few moments, uh, there are linkage to care options available to users. So the next few slides uh, 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 show data from the state of Maryland. I just use these as an, as, as an example. This slide demonstrates that there are more female than male users, so females in orange, males in blue, with uh, smaller numbers of people with other gender identities. Users are predominantly black or African-American, shown, shown in the gray bar, with smaller numbers from other racial groups. So whites are in green, and then the third largest group is uh, those who identify as multiracial. In terms of age range, um, I want the kid is most heavily used by people aged between 25 and 34 years, which are in the gray bar. Uh, with smaller numbers in the orange bar in those aged 18 to 24 years. So there was a sea change in I Want the Kit use in 2020. Prior to COVID-19, or prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, there were on average about 120 orders per month. These were predominantly from white women. With the onset of COVID-19, there was a huge increase in use and this was catalyzed by shutdown of clinical services in the early months of COVID-19 and driven by referrals from Baltimore City Health Department clinicians and the Baltimore City Health Department website. In six months in 2020, I Want the Kit saw a 645% increase in users. And from 2021 onwards, 
uh, we've been in a, a sustainability phase where users are finding out about I want the kit from a host of different sources, including search engines, recommendations by friends, sexual partners, and clinicians. This graph shows positivity by STI by month between 2020 and 2023. Uh, blue represents chlamydia in uh, orange is gonorrhea and trichomonas vaginalis in, uh, in, in gray. So what happens to those individuals who test positive for STIs? Without treatment, STI testing has very little individual or public health benefit. So when users register with this site, they also nominate a treating clinic or provider. Uh, we did an, an analysis that was uh, published by Melendez and, uh, and, and colleagues in 2022, where we looked at um, people who nominated, nominated Baltimore City Health Department as their treating clinic, and we saw that there was a 96% um, um, that 96 of individuals with either chlamydia or gonorrhea were successfully contacted for treatment. Linkage to STI treatment and prevention, including uh, PrEP, um, or HIV PrEP, I should say, uh, prevention services, is key to addressing the epidemic of uh, curable STIs and to, um, and to aid in um, ending the HIV epidemic. And this slide shows how different organizations receive referrals for I Want the Kit user navigation um, to such services. Earlier I mentioned I Want the Kit expansion in 2023, and on this slide um, we can see the states in blue where I Want the Kit is currently available, and in orange are the uh, states where expansion is in progress. By the end of this expansion period, I Want the Kit will be available to users in 17 states. This organization doesn't sit back and rest on its laurels. Um, we are currently uh, considering expansion of the suite of, of tests that we can offer to include HIV antigen antibody and RNA tests, hepatitis C antibody and RNA, and tests for syphilis, including treponemal and non-treponemal tests. We're also um, expanding or hoping to expand the, uh, the sample types used to include uh, plasma serum using finger stick and uh, dry blood spot. So this work is being spearheaded by, um, uh, uh, by Dr. Manabe with um, uh, Johan Melendez providing um, expert uh, lab science support. In addition to, prov to providing STI testing and linkage to care for users, I Want the Kit has also expanded into STI surveillance activities. So we have a public health surveillance protocol that allows us to use de-identified remnant samples to describe epidemiological trends in STIs and emerging or re-emerging infection. Currently, we are um, aided by uh, Justin Hardick from Hopkins testing for rectal lymphogranuloma venereum and are in the final stages of planning to start testing for urogenital and rectal mycoplasma genitalium to estimate prevalence in uh, uh, I want the kit users, and also to estimate the prevalence of associated macrolide resistance mutations. And then finally, we're about to start work with uh, Dr. Heber Mustafa's lab, uh, looking for um, uh, MPOX infection in, um, in rectal samples. I want to just mention that I want the kit is of course not the only show in town when it comes to um, online mail in um, uh, testing uh, platforms. In an analysis of US uh, STI mail in services that was published uh, earlier this year, Mia Pontes from our group evaluated available mail in STI testing programs in the US. Only 25% were free, 30% offered prefixed kits so that there was limited um, uh, choice in terms of STIs that could, uh, STI tests that could be requested. Only 
provided extra genital testing, or 50, it was clear that 50% 50, 50 provided extra genital testing. 15% used their own laboratory, and one commercial lab provided services to five of the 20 organizations. So in summary, online mail-in STI testing uh, is important and it's a growing addition to STI testing services in the US. I've shown how I Want the Kid has expanded and this mirrors expansion of uh, these kind of services elsewhere, such as in the UK where mail-in testing for STIs has really become the default option in many places. An excellent website where laboratory activities can seamlessly dovetail with the results to users is critical to success. And there are many different exciting directions that this type of online platform can go. These include STI treatment and prevention services and package services, for example, um, combining uh, STI treatment with HIV PrEP or with birth control. And finally, I Want the Kit is leveraging its expertise to lead public health surveillance activities, which is key to monitoring and predicting changes in the epidemiology of STI and associated antimicrobial resistance. So I will finish there. Um, thank you very much for your um, attention. Oh, let me just go back one. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the I Want the Kit group at Hopkins as well as our funders who continue to provide support um, for I Want the Kit. Thank you very much. So. Uh, we started a few minutes late, so we have limited time. We want to get everybody to lunch. I would like to, um, if I can ask uh, Dr. Melendez to raise your hand, and I'd like to point out that Dr. Hamill and Dr. Melendez are new members of the HPTN Lab Corps in our STI group, and please welcome them into the uh, lab center and the network. This is a great addition for us, so welcome to both of you. And thank you for both for being here. Um, so we just have time for one or two brief questions, and then we'll let everybody break for lunch. So, um, Wafa? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, the question is for you uh, um, regarding the, uh, the kit. Um, it's really great to see the work. I, I'm kind of thinking a couple of things. So when you get a positive results, then the lab will report this to the, the, just give me a sense, like they report the positive results to the Department of Health, and then the Department of Health reaches out to the individual with a positive test to come in for treatment. That's number question number one. Um, and then the second question is, do you know um, of the people who are requesting the kit, what proportion have our um, patients or suspect that they have an SCI versus a contact of a case? Uh, th thanks so much for, th for the question. To answer the first one, so the, um, the, the I want the kit reaches out to, to the users to provide them with their results. And then those um, individuals are linked to a treating clinic so that they can go and receive their treatment. Do you have a consent to disclose Do you have a consent so, to disclose their results? Yeah, well, the, the, it, so, the, so the, the, we provide the results to the, to the user and then the users seek treatment. And then by law, we have to, I, um, um, we have to um, notify the relevant public health department about notifiable STIs. Um, so in this example, chlamydia, um, in this instance, chlamydia and gonorrhea. Okay, and? And the second part of your question, I retained up until two seconds ago, then forgot. Contact versus case, how do you score that? Right, so um, we, we do collect information about symptom status. Um, so it is possible to, um, to segregate these, um, so the, 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 uh, pr uh, the positivity rates by symptom status, I don't have those data to share today, I'm afraid. Okay. And I'll just take one more question with the group here, and then uh, you're welcome to come ask the speakers questions after, if you have questions. So Stan, I think you were next. Uh, Stan Vermont, uh, Yale School of Public Health. Uh, again, for Matthew, I'm sure you've debated uh, with Charlotte and your colleagues whether to include HPV self-testing in your packet, and you've decided not to, and maybe you would just illuminate. Yeah, um, heaven forbid that I would speak for um, Charlotte Gators or really anyone else um, on the group, but um, 
I think we have to um, just be mindful about what are the organizations that are funding us want us to test for, because really that's what's driving um, the, the, the options for uh, people. We currently don't offer HPV uh, testing, but we're always considering how we can improve um, individual and public health by expanding the, the choice of um, organisms that we test for. So thank you, thanks to all three speakers, please, and then to all of you for your um, attention and attendance here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>